Hello everyone, welcome to the Imperial Holonet, I am JID123, and I'm joined as always by Red Leader Antilles and Dr. Holocron. Say hello. Hey. Go to ya. Go to ya. And today, we're going to talk about politics and Star Wars. Two topics that go hand in hand, especially with this podcast. Because obviously, Star Wars has politics in it, because there's a war going on. And unless they don't know what they're fighting about... Then they gotta have some reason to fight. Although that'd be an interesting story, wouldn't it? A war that they don't remember why they're doing it. It's like, we're just fighting because we just are. I mean, that's the uh, summertime war from Shatterpoint. Ooh, that'd be, ooh, that's a cool No one remembers why it even started. We're just doing it. At this point, it's like, you know what? This is just our life now. <laughs> Screw it. We're going forward. But yes, we are here to talk about politics in Star Wars. The good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. Because Star Wars, while it can be fun to escape as fantasy, it's also about stuff. And it can be fun doing so, too. And you can have fun doing, being about stuff, too. So, um, Red, this was your idea. Where do you want us to start? Yeah, so I kind of wanted to just, you know, generally bounce between topics about kind of what history Star Wars visually and thematically inspires itself from. Uh, not necessarily, like, what is the political stance of the Republic in a specific sense, but just, like, how does Star Wars actually handle politics? Like, I saw someone mentioning the other day, like, does Lucas actually understand politics? And, like, that is a worthwhile question when it comes to Star Wars. Well, he's definitely politically conscious. I, I don't. I think he's definitely. I don't think he's a dummy. Um, but I, I honestly, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this last night for the pre preparation, and um, I would. So, and I have a, like a little bit of a working thesis going on. Um, so, EU legends to like the side for just a second. We'll, we'll bring it back in. When we get more off topic, but just in terms of like. Lucas era Star Wars, so the six movies, and I guess Clone Wars to a certain extent. Honestly, I think the post twenty fourteen era has been a little bit more defined in its politics than the original six, um, especially Rogue One and Last Jedi. Force Awakens Solo kind of more in the vague area, but even so, a little bit more, um, because you know the original trilogy. It's Empire. They're the Rebellion. Remember, I'm, I'm a New Hope. I'll just use New Hope right there. You got the yeah, the Empire's bad. They got the they got the blowing up planet space station. That that's not good. Um, I would question any faction that has that. Um, and then you got the Rebellion. But the Rebellion's kind of vague. Like, what is the Rebellion in a New Hope really? Like, they're lead, led by a princess. There's some general dudes. Who's the father? Is they our king? Is this Final Fantasy twelve? Um, only my. Why are they white? Yeah. Um, with seventy million. Um, and you know, like you know, there's a republic because they mention it, and there's a senate, but that's kind of it. Um. Well, you know, you like you know, you got Rogue One, which is very much a political movie, you know, it, 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 it definitely pulls a lot from, like, modern times, uh, with Jedi and stuff, and, you know, Last Jedi has the whole, has a bit of a war profiteering kind of side plot going on, um, it's not explicit, but, you know, it's there. I mean, um, it is pretty explicit, there's only one place in the galaxy where you could make all this money. <laughs> that is true. And, you know, like, even, like, Solo, the Mimbam, um, scene, you know, it's very clear, we're the hostiles. Um, yeah, we're the hostiles. Um, Han's kind of pointing out, like, uh, guys, we're, the, we're, we're kind of the bad guys of the situation here. Han is woke AF. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and even quite frankly, I feel like, which is TFA and TLJ especially, I feel like I know what the resistance is far more than I do the rebellion, of, at least in terms of um, the original trilogy. Um, <laughs> again, this is not counting the expanding universe. That's a, that's a different beast, which we'll get to. Um... Um, and with the prequels, yeah, there's politics, but I feel like it's one of those situations where it's polit it thinks it's smarter than it actually is. Um, mm -hmm. and there's definitely a message there. I don't, I, I definitely, you know, there's definitely, you know, 
Liberty's dead. The Emperor won. This is not good, folks. But, um, you know, motivations are definitely not as clear and concise. And I think sometimes okay. things come off as they're... And I don't think George intended, but I think that's because, you know, George is a smart dude, but he's not a good writer. I think the problem is he intended too many things that are contradictory. Like, my thing is, Star Wars has always been political, but I hesitate when people act like Star Wars is is great political writing or that Lucas' message is inherently coherent because it seems like he relies a lot on metaphor, which is fine, but doesn't exactly define, uh, you know, how much is something inspired by what it's inspired by, you know, how much of it is one-to-one, and just kind of contradictory things. Like, the Empire in the original trilogy is very much based on the Third Reich, but they're also, you know, reference to, uh, uh, you know, Cold War America and American foreign policy. But do they act like that, really? Like, uh, I very def- clearly there's an opposition to, to Vietnam in there. But I, you know, kind of have to question how much is the Empire actually a biting commentary of that or even satire but when dude, functionality... don't you know that Wicked is just Ho Chi Minh, man? It's the Viet Cong. Oh, let's, yeah, we'll get into that. Um, the uncomfortable nature of the benevolent white person kind of stuff that you get when Star Wars tries to deal with... Uh, essentially any minority but like with the empire there's clearly like that you know nixonian and then later reagan politics influence in it but the empire you know they remove the senate immediately uh uh, their militarism is very much like they're a completely taken over state so you can make the argument okay they're america if it was completely military controlled i guess but that isn't really as present like it kind of is just the military dictatorship which isn't as fair of a comparison with something like vietnam when you have you know the culpability of the american people in that no you're right and you know just to add a little bit more mud to the water, it kind of it gets a little harder to take seriously in terms of the one-to-one when you find out, oh, the leader of the Empire is this evil wizard. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, there's, there's lots of parallels and stuff like that, but, you know, he's still evil wizard. Um, I mean, I'm fine with that. It's, oh, no, I don't care about it. I mean, yeah, it works. Um, yeah, it just kind of becomes a question of uh, what are our heroes opposing like it's you know our our heroes are you know represented by what a princess so you have monarchy which yes later like lucas has this obsession with monarchy and then that never gets really fixed exactly in the films themselves where it's all about democracy but is you know leading characters are always kind of romanticized versions of a monarchy I mean, Luke isn't even really fighting for the rebellion. He's, I, I just thought of this. He is, a, he is the Disney 90s prince, Disney princess. He wants more. He wants to be where the X-Wings are. He wants to be, he wants to fight the Empire, even though he doesn't know why. Um, I, I mean, he knows, he knows why. It's oh, yeah. just they, they completely over, they never bring it up again. And you got Han, who's like... Because they burnt his aunt and uncle to death. That's true. Um, but yeah, it's like, we see the Empire mostly fighting, you know, I- its own people, which is is fine, again, but I hesitate to call it, like, there is clearly an influence, and that's fine, That's that, that is perfectly fine if that's all it needs to be, my pushback comes when Star Wars fans act like Star Wars is this fantastically structured, or at least even coherent argument 
against anything in particular. Oh, goodness, no. Um, like, once you get to, like, like, it's, there is vague ideas of Nixon being a person who exists, nothing about Nixonian politics really factor into the way the Empire functions, though. Our heroes aren't really a representative of anything except for kind of idealized neoliberalism, which we'll get into because that still has influences, but, like, even into Rogue One, but at least, like, Rogue One's the first time I think that message has ever actually been really thought about beyond, I dislike this thing, so the enemies will be, you know, will hastily have an element of that thing thrown onto them in a superficial way. Because, like, when you had the Empire uh, on Jedha, that's when you finally get the Empire being a representation of American imperialism actually fit for once. Oh, you're right, and um, I think that's one of the that's that's the thing about Star Wars, which is both its detriment and its strength in a strange way, at least in the original trilogy, that you can kind of view it as anything, really. Like, there is a conservative um, viewpoint of Star Wars, which is funny enough, um, like, you know, like, the rebellion is are the libertarians fighting the big government who want to take your taxes. Uh, many years ago, I saw this weird take. I'm, I'm not saying these takes are right, by the way. I'm just, I'm just saying what I'm seeing. Like, how because of the, a deleted scene uh, from A New Hope about the Empire nationalizing the farms, it's like, Star Wars was about capitalism, communism, stuff like that. And it, you know, it's like... Just because there's one scene about that was tweeted about the Empire nationalizing the farms and Uncle Owen has to sell out. Um, yeah, it's definitely I, I like... Like, when people... I, I think it becomes... It only becomes a problem when the fandom and even writers begin to kind of act like... Not, not a prerequisite, but like... Star Wars' politics are kind of definitive in any way. Like, obviously, people who have a very right-wing take on it are, are wrong, and that's very much not what Lucas was. But we can't just pretend like it's, oh, people just aren't paying attention. Star Wars is, you know, a leftist, you know, wet dream. Like, no, it is very much flawed. Like, it's not so much that it's not like people who don't get Star Trek where Star Trek obviously has incredibly flawed politics all on its own I'm not going to get into that because I, I would be here all day talking about the Federation but like Star Wars isn't nailed down in any way but I think fans will then attest to like you know, Star Wars has always been political. Yes. Has it been good with its politics? You know, is it something that is even at all completed? Or was Lucas's po political views actually factoring into it in an effective manner? Or was it kind of just, you know, a vague idea? Well, like, there, there's definitely elements of Vietnam... Throughout, and then there's there's definitely elements of obviously World War II symbolism, but are those the same thing? Like it's not like Star Wars was ever even into the the prequels with the liberal stuff. It's there is elements of like Dick Cheney involved in that, but I would hesitate to call the prequels even satire or commentary on the war on terror. Lucas was clearly had a political view in that factors in, but not in a way that's any more significant than any writer's politics factor into their work. And when we act like Star Wars is political commentary in any coherent way, we end up actually, I feel, just opening the door for misinterpretation, bad reads, and kind of a bad political takeaway where even where it's so easy for anyone to assign really any political view mm. to it 
And once you open that floodgate and, uh, you know, say, oh, Star Wars has always been uh, about this. Look, yes, Star Wars has always been leftist. It's also got a lot of, like, right-wing stuff involved. It's also very neoliberal. But people want to defend the politics of it so much that we end up losing sight of the fact that we kind of have to criticize it and we have to... uh, you know, question and then ask for it to be uh, better at that. Otherwise, you know, you, you kind of just promote a... Uh, I, I'm trying to think of a good other example of something that, like, clearly has political aspirations, but its politics are flawed, but fans uh, really want to defend it. Well, Star Trek. <laughs> um, yeah. That's kind of the only thing I can think of that I know about. For um, me, um, by the way, I'm here, too. Okay. I guess we should let Doc talk. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Doc. Add uh, your take. For me, if I had to compare politics and Star Wars to any one thing, it would I would probably see it as like kind of like a Jackson Pollock painting, kind of. Like, um, there are bits and pieces of, like, like uh, really solid political ideas here and there that you'll see once in a while, but then it'll also blend into this other thing that doesn't totally mesh well with it. And at the end of the day, it's just kind of a bunch of different ideas just thrown in there, but they don't always, they aren't always cohesive with each other. And for me, I think a perfect example of that is a uh, Saw Guerrero and the Partisans. Um, as much as I love Saw and the Partisans, and while I love what they've brought to Star Wars overall, I do think people do, we, and the writers uh, behind them as well, I think there is some confusion as to whether or not what they're specifically meant to represent. Obviously, you can see uh, the partisans as like Antifa or like, you know, any organization fighting against fascism, but also, you know, we're supposed to condemn them for, you know, causing civilian casualties and stuff. And while I think there are certain pieces of media that handle that really well, like Rebel Rising and um, In the Name of the Rebellion stuff that really gets Saw and what he's supposed to represent for the rebellion, the empire and everything, there are also times where I feel like it gets a little muddied as to whether or not how much we're supposed to sympathize with them and how much we're supposed to oppose them. Mm-hmm. I think another great example is, of course, uh, the Jedi. Uh, there's No one gets the Jedi. Um, <laughs> I've been curious if George Lucas... I think George Lucas does. I just don't think he knows how to write it. Um, I don't think he knows how to even talk about it because Mike and I always been up with Lucas is... I think he understands what he's trying to say, but he never defines his terms. Can I read you a quote from Master and Apprentice? Because I feel like Claudia Gray strangely nailed it. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. Okay. As she always does. Okay, so this is, um, so I'll give you some context. Um, Qui-Gon is talking to a friend of his who was, they're both apprentices of Dooku. The apprentice of Dooku, the other apprentice of Dooku is kind of like, you know, is this light dark balancing really necessary? Like, you know, because they're like, like, there's always, like, darkness always going to show up and blah, 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 blah. And, like, is this really balanced? And then Qui-Gon says, and here's the quote, It matters which side we choose, even if there will never be more light than darkness, even if there can no be no, be no more joy in the galaxy than there is pain, for every action we undertake, for every word we speak, for every life we touch, it matters. I don't turn towards the light because it means someday I'll win. Some sort of cosmic game. I turn toward it because it's the light. End quote. That's fantastic. That's a good quote. Um, and then we actually talked about that. That's a, and actually, screw anybody who says Qui Gon's a great Jedi. Yeah, that's actually a really good remind. It's a very Kingdom Hearts quote, and I love it for that. Um, but the like, one time Grey Jedi is even used in a Star Wars thing, uh, is I think it's in like the beginning of Star Kyber Space War, where uh, what is it, Ty Baka? Who was the, the Jedi who was on who was a Wookiee Jedi on the council? Yeah, Force Master. Yeah, he refers to Qui-Gon as a gray Jedi in essentially more of a joking way. It's like that's the only time it's ever actually been used. Maybe he meant it as like he's getting really old and his hair is starting to gray. <laughs> I mean he's one to talk. <laughs> gray pot calling the gray kettle black. Exactly. Gray. I mean uh, Wookiees don't really age really. Oh uh, Ty Baka was. <laughs> um Although, funny enough, that book got bring back the term Dark Jedi. Um, nice. Uh, so they're a thing again. Um, I would just be Green Jedi and Blue Jedi and Red Jedi. And Rainbow Jedi. Jedi. We'll have a whole Lantern Corps of Jedi. Oh, uh, that'd be awesome. But uh, yeah, with what Doc was saying with Rogue One, yeah, and then you have stuff like, you know, the, the clear allusions to the Middle East, 
Mm-hmm. And then you have to deal with the fact that, well, then what does that make Saw? Yeah. Yeah, like, like is he sitting seen... in front of a TV with a big beard wagging his finger like certain terrorists used to do? <sighs> yeah, like... Like I, I a revolutionary know. leader who has just gone a bit too far, or well, like... You know. No, I mean, I'm talking like... Bin Laden. Is he Bin Laden? Yeah, Biden. like that, that's the that's the thing you run into there. <laughs> when you try and do the political commentary, then you end up opening the door for all kinds of different reads that, you know, we can say, oh, Lucas was woke AF. It's like, but he was so neoliberal and there was so much mm-hmm. counter politics that, yes, Star Wars has always been liberal, but I, I push back when fans act like it's great liberal commentary because I think part of why you have so many right-wing fans who try and claim Star Wars is specifically because we don't challenge Lucas enough. Hmm. Also remember, you know, maybe no excuse, maybe, but Lucas is still a product of his time. Um, You know, and I I don't want to, you know, I, I, you know, we challenge Lucas, obviously, you're right. But, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to be careful and, like, say, oh, Lucas is a bad man. He's a a human being and he was flawed, like everyone. He was, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not saying he's a complete dummy. He, he, he seems like a very smart man. Like, I honestly would like to just sit down and just sort of, like, what are your thoughts on this? Um, And there are times where I feel like, uh, sorry. I, I do think it'll be an interesting conversation compared, uh, you know, to say the least. I don't think he's like, you know, like, I just think it was cool, so explosions. Um, I do think he can be methodical about this stuff, but, you know, he's a product of his time, and Star Wars today is the product of today as well as trying to be timeless, and, you know, it's kind of like you balance it out, like, you're a product of the day, but you got to be timeless, and you got to do this and that, and it's like, it's a juggling act. Like, I, I, do not, I, I do not envy anyone who works in this field. Um, yeah, I, I think... Lucas is a lot like Roddenberry, where you know how there was that you know decade or two after TOS and before TNG, where pretty much all that Roddenberry did was pitch his occasional pilots that were always the same exact story, slightly changed, that never got past pilot, <laughs> uh, involving men in togas. He always loved that, uh, and like all he did other than that was you know, go around to colleges and give speeches and be told how brilliant he was. Like, watch the, uh, I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but the documentary Chaos on the Bridge, which is about the first two seasons of TNG and the -the behind-the-scenes stuff, and they they give some really good points, and like like the actual members of the cast, uh, like Stewart, giving really good points about, you know, Roddenberry being told how brilliant and fantastic his politics were to the point that he almost lost sight of what the politics of TOS were and didn't, you know, really evaluate himself to the point that, you know, it becomes, in the future, children won't even grieve when their parent is killed because we've moved beyond that. And it's like, that's not, you know, the optimistic future that you sold us in the first place. You know, the ego has been stroked so much (laughs) that they, you know, read into the over-analysis or, you know, kind of the scholarly debate of their works and forget how much of that is textual and how much of that is, you know, extrapolating based on their personal politics being evaluated in comparison, which is something I think Lucas was a little bit better with, where he did understand that he wasn't writing an allegory for the Vietnam War, but he had done Star Wars after having finally said, okay, fine, I won't be able to do uh, the film adaptation of in, of uh, Heart of Darkness, which became Apocalypse Now. And so those political views, it wasn't so much a allegory as I think a lot of fans and documentaries want to say it is, as much as it was just Lucas's own politics that he had now had his outlet for were you know, stopped, the vent is closed, and so that goes somewhere. Yeah, and yeah. I think when fans stop realize, stop thinking of it as that is where the problem happens, where it's almost less on Lucas and more, you know, kind of on the, the fandom. I don't want to necessarily blame the fandom too much for that, but also, yes, it's the fans' fault. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of it's gonna depend on who the writer is at the end of the day. And you know, it's like they can make their state like a lot. I always have to be careful about listening to statements from the writers because like a lot of it's just marketing. Like, eh, you know, we gotta, we gotta respect Lucas, blah 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 blah. You know, that's just PR. Um, and look what they're actually writing. Um, cause like I said, you know, I feel like this new era, at least again, not counting the EU. We'll bring that in. Don't worry, folks. We'll bring that in. Um, you know, I feel like they're 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 definitely touching things that even the original trilogy's not like. Um, can I give some quasi spoilers for the Mandalorian? Not in terms of what I know, but just from the footage that I've seen. Sure, I've seen it too. Okay, right. so it's like you know, um, one of the big things about the Mandalorian is you know it's gonna it's gonna deal with the fallout of the post Jedi world. Um. And I, I like the I like there's one there's a Warner Herzog's giving like an evil monologue. He's I think he's an imperial character. Um, I don't know what he is. He just he has stormtroopers obeying him, so he's imperial. Um, you know he's like the Empire used to you know bring joy to everything it touches, and then it shows a bunch of stormtroopers burning down a house. Um, and then it's like shows a bunch of fighting and stuff like that, and he's like Herzog is like. Is this what you thought when the revolution happened? Um, and I know one of the characters is like a rebel who's like trying to deal with post-war world and how they fit and something like that. It's like you know, um, you know, it's it's definitely getting a lot more. I don't want to say like super duper deep. I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen the show, but it's definitely dealing with some of the things I don't think even the original trilogy dealt with, like. Oh, you see, we ended up turning the Jedi, and it's like, you know, can you feel the love? And now Mandalorian's like, oh, wait, well, maybe it's not all can you feel the love? Because there's going to be fighting and chaos and I don't know, maybe... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now I'm imagining, like, uh, Yubnub playing over footage of, like, Scarif getting blown up and, like, Jeff <laughs> being destroyed. I just think, like, the real world equivalent. Gosh, um, like because we have the Ewoks, you know, all cheering, and it's the the Viet Cong reference. But then, like, cut to like actual, even modern day Vietnam, where like demining minefields is still a thing, and it's like, yup, no, 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 I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got more yep, depressing. Nub. You you sh you cut to the classic scenes of people trying to get out of Vietnam as the North Vietnamese come in and just hear the song and you feel the love and all the sad faces and the kids. It'll be like a dark broody version of Yub Nub, like when like in like when we have those trailers that do like dark broody versions of like happy songs. Have you guys listened to our watched uh, Arl Knots their edit of like how to make a movie trailer? <laughs> no, but that <laughs> they did a they did a version of that. But with you, uh, with like a record baby, <laughs> and then they released a full version. It's amazing. Where it's the dark and edgy version of that. <laughs> oh man, that sounds great. It's it's lovely. Uh, but no, like you know, maybe I don't know. If, I know it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be set. I think they have confirmed it's gonna be set on Tatooine, or at least uh, oh. part of it is. So it, like, yeah, it almost seems so, like that. So like you could almost get into like you know. What happens when you take out the head gangster? Because, you know, in real life, when you actually do take out the head gangster, like a drug cartel, it actually just makes things worse. Um, you know, you chop mm. off the head, and then all the little gangs that you could control is now vie for power, and they're even more violent. And, you know, it's, it's hell. It's heck. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like, it's just interesting that we're going to start seeing that sort of stuff. Um, again, this is compared just to the original six films in Clone Wars. Um mm. You see a lot of themes kind of returning, like found family. That's definitely a theme I think that's been um, of this new era quite a bit. You know, with Ray, Ezra, Kaz, Jin. Um, I guess kind of solo. Um, so you know, I just I just think again, I think it's just because we're getting different writers um, who aren't George, and they're <laughs> then they're better at their job. Uh, well, you know, so far. Um, but yeah, um, Doc, how about you take us somewhere? Where do you, where do you want to take us? You've been, I've, I've, we've sort of dominated. Um, so we've been talking about the movies a lot, and I also think that uh, it's important to touch on the animated uh, side of things as well. Um, obviously, uh, you know, Clone Wars uh, definitely dealt with a lot of politics uh, to varying degrees of success throughout its uh, six, uh, coming up on seven seasons. 
Um, there were certain arcs that I think handled politics better. Like, I think the Ryloth arc is pretty solid in terms of, you know, the ideas it's trying to tackle and the things it's trying to say in terms of, like, you know, uh, protecting a people versus subjugating them and stuff like that. I think there's some decent commentary there. But then there's also kind of weird stuff that we just kind of glance over, like, you know, them using, uh, like, uh, torches on the Geonosians in the Geonosis episodes. And I remember never watching that. It's like, ooh, that's probably a war crime. Like, oh, yeah, that, that, that's probably a war crime you're I mean, even burning corpses is a war crime, right? Yeah. Well, I know you can burn your dead, but I think, well, I well, don't know. Well, like, burning uh, corpses, I think, without it being, like, the actual people having the, doing it themselves. Luke committed a war crime at the end of Return of the Jedi. He burnt <laughs> his own father's corpse. Oh, I, no. I heard somewhere you know, that his body might have disappeared by that time, but I don't know if that would have happened. But that's not a discussion. It's, it's an empty carcass in the suit. He's just burning the suit. There's nothing inside anymore. <laughs> um, I'm actually kind of curious. That's actually kind of the curious thing about Clone Wars, just to kind of get that discussion, is to see what the new season will be like without George. Um, because it's sort of like, um, the Ahsoka Alone arc, which is happening this, which is one of the, the arcs they chose to, uh, redo for season seven, you know, that that's very different now, um, yeah. to what it originally was. It's like, it's no longer a guy, it's like two sisters, um, mm -hmm. and originally the guy was going to be Han Solo. That, that does sound like a very George thing to do. He wanted um, Han for Return of the, uh, Return of the Sith. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's he would have been like nine years old, I think. I think he was yep. about to be on Kashyyyk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that would have been interesting. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, I'm very curious about that. Um, we do, um, from what we can tell, uh, it wasn't a lot, but, um, at the beginning of the trailer for season seven, um, we have a little dialogue exchange between, uh, Soka and one of the sisters where she's talking about how, you know, she used to be, uh, you know, up on the higher levels of Coruscant, and the sister's like, you're probably better off down here with the Jedi running around starting wars and everything. And it'd be cool if the season actually touched on, you know, how much of a role the Jedi played in, you know, exacerbating the war and, like, you know, uh, kind of making things worse instead of making things better. Uh, the previous season did try to touch on that a little bit, but didn't really go far enough in places, as far as I believe. But, um, I'm excited to see uh, if they actually try to tackle that stuff in an interesting way in this season. My only problem is we seem to so often put, like, blame for the war on the Jedi in these stories. Like, when we question the war effort mm -hmm. instead of, uh, you know, the Republic's culpability or the fact that the Separatists, you know, what actually are the, is it that the Separatists want? Which, to talk about Clone Wars in a political sense... Like, I see people coming, you know, the say war it's... Or the or the TV series? Both. Like, people saying it's it's based on the war, war on terror. It's like, is it, though? Because there's clearly, like, Lucas talking about, like, the, the Separatists being based on Cheney, but then the, the Republic is very much, like, Bush. So what what are we... What exactly are we doing? Everybody there? sucks, the show. But then they pull shit like, oh, there's heroes on both sides. Just take <laughs> our word from it. And then sometimes they're like, the Republic is up on you. It's so corrupt. Okay, show us that corruption. Like, there is never really much depth to that, especially when uh, the people leading the Confederacy are openly, you know, businesses. <laughs> and so it's just like... What is, what is the well, point? Yeah, 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 it's like, what is the Clone Wars actually about? And, well, like, you can't, there is a lot of potential to tell a story about, like, good people who work for the Separatists because of what the Republic has done to them. Like, I heard, I read a while back that uh, before, uh, you know, the Rise of the Empire, Cassian's family was a member of a Separatist cell during the Clone Wars. And, mm -hmm. like, that's a story that I think would be really interesting to tell and actually show, like, you know, kind of the, while the Separatists obviously are doing bad things, it's possible to show that some of them have, like, sympathetic reasons for opposing the Republic. I think, I think that the Clone Wars, the actual war, uh, about the show, or the 2D show, is, is, 
I think it overcomplicates a pretty almost simplistic conflict of of un not unruly that's a, that's a big word of disenfranchised planets that feel like the republic is screwing them and they secede. Dooku mm. like it's Dooku's rallying all the poor and the the the, 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 the more downtrodden planets, for lack of better terms, because he feels because they feel the Republic is screwing them over. I'm sorry, but when you said Duke was rallying all the poor, I thought you were gonna say he's rallying all the porgs. <laughs> he might be rallying. There might be some porgs in the crowd. There could be some pro Duku porgs against the Wookiees. Uh, um. Yeah, like Lucas is kind of wishy washy with that stuff. Like, uh, there's that opening speech, or not, but like, or like forward, uh, Lucas has at the beginning of. Uh, Shatterpoint, I think it was. He wrote something in Shatterpoint? Yeah, he wrote the foreword. Oh, that's cool. Uh, and he, like, talks about it being, like, the point when, uh, you know, corporations become so big and th that being uh, where the war comes from. Uh, but then you have to, you know, like, that, that's interesting. I really like that idea, and that's where clearly the war on terror stuff comes from. But then you have to deal with, okay, well, why are other planets joining in? You know, we talk about the problems with the Republic, but those seem different than the problems with the corporations. Hmm. Right. Like, I, I... There's, there's not exactly a uh, examination of it. Uh, ever. Like, you get the occasional, you know, heroes on both sides, but that's not enough. Mm. In, in my view, like, you know, there, there's the fact that, uh, you know, Joel, you knows our friend uh, Barris always talks, Barris Coffee always talks about the, the fact that, you know, the Separatists are always shown as aliens. Mm. And just kind of the implicitness of, they never really question that like like I actually I pulled up some of those conversations uh, like Star Wars has a long tendency of vilifying aliens attack of the clones and miffed me and they're like at least attack of the clones you know made it a deliberate thing at least like that's an excuse the revenge of the Star Wars like, Jedi that is essentially the equivalent of hey I have black friends <laughs> I got black friends but, that's the space equivalent. Uh, well, like, the word Friends of the Sith, novelization... I'm just which, saying, like, if that was his intention, then, like, I don't know, like, if he was trying to say a specific thing about the whole human versus alien thing, if he's trying to say that kind of message, I think it's really kind of muddled and he doesn't really do anything with it, really. Yeah, I, but I, mean, th I think the thing is Lucas uses aliens as shorthand. Like, any time there's a Rodian in his stories, they're always slimy. Mm. or they're uh, shown as, like, a coward. Like, I always think about uh, in Clone Wars with, like, the, the Anaconda Far stuff, where, like, joining the Separatists is shown as this such a... You know, despite the fact that we do the whole heroes on both sides shit at times, him working with the Separatists is shown as such a... How could you do this to, Repub you know, to the Republic? How could you do this to Padme? And then later we have, uh, what's your name, Lulo, you know, assassinate him because Rhodia is now suffering because of the war. And Padme kind of just plays it as like, you're so selfish. And it's like, yeah, you go, white person who was raised in privilege and on a planet that hasn't been harmed by the Republic recently and hasn't been as... I mean, obviously there's the Blue Shadow virus, but, like, it so unanimously sides with Padme on that. and Because for, she's one of our protagonists. Yeah, and it's, like, it's always the humans versus either the sympathetic, the cowardly, the evil, or just slimy Rodians. Like, we, that's just a trend that we get so often in Star Wars. I, that's an, that's a, that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of interested in season seven of Clone Wars to see if they learn some lessons, um, 
because, you know, it's been a few years now. Um, and I feel like we're trying. I, I don't know. It's not perfect. But I feel like we're trying to get more away with that. Like, see Rodians who aren't slimy. Um, you know, Resistance had a Nemoidian who wasn't Japanese and he was chubby. Um, <laughs> but I think he was a bad guy. Um, he was, right? Yeah. But, you yeah. know, he wasn't Japanese. No. What? <laughs> but he was an, uh, an Asian stereotype, so... Um... Uh, I don't think we've seen the Moidians in a while. Actually, you know, that's actually something I've noticed recently. We don't see a lot of the Seppi, um, aliens anymore. A lot. We, we do have Rodians in the Poe comic. That's true. Um... They're, they're still, they're still bankers. Well, yeah, well, yeah, well that's, well, that's even worse than being a smuggler. I respect a bounty hunter, but a banker? No. Uh, um... Uh, it, but, like... What what I was saying, continuing from that, was uh, what what Paris had said was the Revenge of the Sith novelization was the only source that claimed Dooku hated non-humans, that he and Palpatine had specifically chosen uh, companies run by unsavory non-humans to serve as villains in their mock battle. This implies that the, there are more humans proportionately in the galaxy far, far away than any other species for that to actually work. All of the sources went with, it just happened to be aliens. Some went with, there were also humans. But they were usually a rarity outside of a few all oddballs until TCW. Most importantly is what the general audience, who doesn't read the books, see on screen without any further explanation. Beyond Palpatine, our heroes are fighting aliens pretty much the whole time of the prequel trilogy. Yeah. Um, I right. And I, I had a whole response to that, that... Uh, yeah, I'll just read. Uh, well said. This is one of the big reasons why I include aliens with the overall discussion of diversity in Star Wars, because how we portray them uh, as uh, how we portray them in a universe only as minorities is super as only minorities in a fictional universe is reflective of how we treat real minorities and can so easily give off a lesson to kids. Because uh, this started because of that in the uh, Young Jedi Night books. There was this diversity alliance led by Ula's sister, where it was a bunch of aliens who hate humans. It's and the, they're, what's the Young Jedi books again? I don't. Remember. Uh, Young Jedi Knight. Is this like an old thing? I don't remember. Yeah, it's Kevin J. Anderson. Ah. Writing children books, and, and I'm not going to get into it because that is such a different problem, and we might need to do a video on it all on its own. It's so bad, but. But I did find out about the Diversity uh, Alliance okay. a while back and wanted to vomit. The saddest thing for me is that even when Star Wars tries to do something uh, to improve uh, something to improve itself on the front of how aliens are treated uh, as well as droids, they either sort of snicker at the argument like in Solo, loop them in with extremists like in the Confederacy of Independent Systems, or link them to extremists like Saw. I love Rogue One and the Partisans, but I am still willing to bet that part of the reshoots... Uh, involved cutting down the arc with the partisans, with there being evidence of them being them being on Scarif originally. It <laughs> seems that Star Wars still has trouble portraying the anger and disillusion of in-universe minorities without telling the story from the, the POV of the uh, of the majority, uh, and oftentimes coming down with the lesson that the liberal rebellion or our adjacent heroes are the only right path. Like when we see a predominantly uh, minority and alien rebel cell that does not serve Moth, uh, Mothma's wishes, as uh, they are condemned. Agree or disagree with Saw, there's an, that narrative is intentional or otherwise, that the almost positivist neoliberal heroes are right, and the alien characters and droids should get in line with our protagonists if they want to be in the right. Those are the only options posed, or ambivalence. It frustrates me that stories is like that of the Lerman. Uh, we have being aliens being mistreated by the Seppies and are thus shown the quote-unquote truth that they need to pick a side, i.e. the Republic. Obviously, I support getting involved and would say fighting along with the pubs is correct over Satine or with the Se uh, being ambivalent like Satine or being with the Seppies, but the fact that they that we just give those options of being pitted uh, by our protagonists 
uh, and taken in as the Tolkien aliens, because Tolkien like guy, uh, or sorry, Tolkien black guy is the is a joke on the forums, because Tolkien doesn't have any, any minorities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the extremists often portrayed as really just being manipulated or utterly non-committal is frustrating. They never sat right with me that even with the season, even with season after season of TCW, they never really seemed to want to address why so many aliens did not wish to help the Republic. Like I said, it is either one side or the other or no involvement at all. This is why the partisans are so important and why I really wish we got more of Gareth's vision of the galaxy. Yeah, like even while I adore In the Name of the Rebellion, I still get a, dis- a bit disappointed in that we have a bunch of aliens enslaved by the Empire who joined the Ghost Crew and not Saw. Maybe I'm looking too far into it, but there is this intentional or otherwise narrative of the Partisans being understandable bad guys, and thus the correct decision being to get in line and back up our leads so they can feel good about themselves while also feeling inclusive without having to actually address what other people are saying. It just seems like the conversation is never actually had, but rather faked amidst a larger narrative that is really puppeteering the discourse. Star Wars may seek to show Alien to the Rebellion, but at the end of the day, they are more or less used as tokens to have our heroes not seem utterly caught up in their own human-centric fight, or they're coded as bad guys in some way. This is the su- this is something that bugged me with the Rodians being portrayed as slimy, or good so long as they decide that Padme and the Republic are totally right wholeheartedly. Like Lolo, yeah, Lolo uh, was wrong to kill Far, but still I can't shake the fact that the narrative is focused more on speciesism towards the Kaminoans that doesn't get addressed or called out as anything wrong, um, coupled with supporting the message of Padme is always right, look at this murdering, backstabbing alien, and uh, this is how the other that does not support our main characters act. Sure, I doubt this is the point, but when we do finally hear out the Separatists, it's a boring human with boring motivations and vague ideals. Not an alien with any real reason to be infuriated with the Republic. Either you side with us and are good, or are a traitorous rat. This is what it all comes off at as all too often. They don't even get me starting on the racial coding of the prequel trilogy aliens. Yeah. End of France. Yeah. Think, also, by think, the way, I found out The Young Jedi Knights, the Star Wars Young Adult Fiction Series by science fiction writer K. Jaron Anderson, published from 1995 to 1998. Yeah, I have some of those. They, I, I need to read them, because there, there are definitely good things I've heard about them. It's just... I mean, there was a whole... I'm not going to just do that because I've had long conversations about them and comparing them to Magneto and how we handle sympathetic minority revolutions that maybe are treated as terrorist groups and how that is treated in media. But essentially, my my overall point is, even with Saw, it's always the white or human, you know, neoliberal rebellion that sort of still fetishizes monarchy that's treated as our good guys, always. Even when Star Wars, you know, talks about democracy, we, like, treat it like something that, you know, we we either shit on it and focus on stuff that's military-centric. I have other quotes about that, but I'm going to let you guys talk for a bit instead of making this all just a bunch of reading quotes. Um, I was just going to say, I think the one time in Clone Wars where we directly address, like, species, uh, like speciesism is uh, in uh, Innocence of Ryloth, when we have Boyle, you know, using a slur to refer to the Twi'lek population. And um, we do uh, kind of, we don't really, you know, totally, I mean, go back to it, but um, we do see, you know, that kind those kind of prejudices do exist within the clone army, and I think it's good to, you know, show that. I just wish we would go a little farther with it. Yeah, it's like we talked about in our review with... Uh... Ben, when talking about that, that like comparing it with like the Federation calling the Cardassians spoonheads, like <laughs> those little things add just a lot of flavor. Yeah. Do you think? I think one of the problems is that maybe we shouldn't. We should try and do other conflicts besides fighting the fascistic empire. Um. Or make the solution not just uh, <laughs> led by a bunch of too. white neoliberals. Well, that always uh, helps. But, but, you know. but yeah, I think other conflicts would be great. 
Because it's always either like giant alien invasion or, you know, we're hyping up a droid revolution uh, as the next enemy. Uh, I mean, almost certainly. There's no way the droid Gotra is going to be good guys. No. I mean, I you saw what they do in Last Shot. That's what I want. Yeah, let's let's lead, let's help droids out, but no, do not help the droid Gotra. <laughs> Don't help the droid. Uh, isn't the droid, droid, I think the droid Gotra, that's like, isn't the droid Gotra going to be in the Mandalorian? Probably. I, I heard, in, I thought I heard somewhere that they were going to show up in the Mandalorian. And like yeah, IG, IG-80 something. It's not IG-80, it's like it's, it's just cut in IG-89. Um, yeah, because they always have... You always gotta add another IG-88. There's like a dozen of them. See, the IG-80 family, man. They're, 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 they're you know, they're they're everywhere. They, they run IG-88. The sh- <laughs> ah. Um, I always really like that. That, like, yeah, you always... We were able to actually kill him off and have another one take his place with slightly different focuses. Cut that one IG-88. Two more will take its place. Uh, pretty much. It's a fun gimmick. I, I genuinely hope throughout the show we kill him off at the end of every episode and have another one come back with slightly different, like, personality. They killed IG-88! <laughs> like, well, here's IG-89, and he is a, a mob boss with a robotic Italian accent. Oh, he died. Here's IG-90. He's, he's a cool you dude. know, like... He's a cool dude. Yeah, like, he's just... he's. He's just a normal, normal guy. Oh, he does. IG-91 is... He's a psychopath. He's a surfer, bro. (laughs) Yeah. We just keep rotating with no real, like, point to it. Just, hey, a new personality matrix. It happens. That'd be cool. Um, you know, like... Like, after watching Game of Thrones, I'm like, just give me Game of Thrones and Star Wars. Just all the bad... It's a story about all the power players trying to screw each other over, and it just ends horribly for everyone. Everyone dies. The end. Um, and Charles guess... Dance is the chancellor. Um, <laughs> I love Charles Dance. I guess so that was the, the other kind of idea that I want to talk about to see how what you're saying of... You know, what other kind of conflicts or actually basing things on real-world political events... Do you guys want to see? Because we do so much with rebellion versus empire, or like when we do something that's like Vietnam, it's still the benevolent white guy shows up to help the peaceful, cheery natives. It's the same thing we do with the fucking Gungans. Ooh, like Gungans. It, it's always within a very fucked up context. Where then the one time we have aliens who are just overtly like, "Nah, fuck that. We do it on our own terms." They're treated as terrorists and kind of coded, despite the fact that we have a, you know, Middle East environment with the Empire very much being, you know, genuinely intentionally portrayed as being similar to America. We still kind of code the partisans as being like ISIS or Al Qaeda. I think the only time we didn't do that was with Mimban and we don't see the Mimbanese. Yeah. And in. They're so interesting because they're not just the Gungans where it's, you know, the in peace with nature, 90s, you know, last of the Mohicans, dances with wolves, Fern Gully, or not Fern Gully, doesn't really play Avatar, you know, you know what I'm talking about, like 90s neoliberal views of Native Americans. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, like the, the Mimbanese are, like, the one time you don't really get that, because, like... Jar Jar singing uh, Colors of the Wind. Oh, my Just, God. I can't, I can't do the Jar Jar voice, and I don't remember the lyric to Colors of the Wind. Have you ever heard the, the wolf's a cry to the, uh, what is it, blue corn moons? I need this. I need that. I don't care how racist it is. I need that now. It's um, <laughs> the I don't care. I just, I really need that. It's like, okay. Um, um, no. But yeah, like, the Mimbanese have, like, you know, weapons that they got from the clones, and that's kind of interesting, because that's a thing that happens in the real world. No, uh, and that's kind of one of the reasons I'm kind of excited for, like, the TV shows. Well, I guess Mandalorian, because that's post-Return of the Jedi. It's like, your empire is gone. There is no rebellion. It's just... Chaos, or whatever. I think Cassian will show that stuff as That's, well with like, you. you know, maybe the Mimbanese will show up there. But like, 
the fact that they're not the like you know avatar kind of using the spirits of the nature and the pan flutes to destroy the military stuff it's like no they have like reappropriated clone guns that they're they're shooting some motherfuckers with and it's like yes this is what i'm talking about <laughs> excuse me um you know what the sad thing about fan menace is it's the only time that we actually got a conflict that wasn't a traditional Star Wars conflict in in a sense of it's not a government trying to take over and we're not a rebellion. It's just a mega corporation being a douche. Um yeah. it'd be like if 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 Amazon it's the Banana Wars. It'd be like if Amazon occupied Arizona or something. Um or Italy. Um I don't know why I use that as an, ex- as an example. <laughs> Again, Banana Wars. You have a literal verbal example right there. Yeah, Banana Wars, sure. Um, although the government is trying to actually stop them. Um, but yeah, um, you know. Uh, yeah, I guess. Right, Padme, but to be fair, the government... Uh, Padme's not happy about it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Valorum is, is what Roosevelt. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, they, they do actually draw that comparison to an extent, like his equivalent of gunboat gunboat diplomacy in a uh, play, I guess. I can't but, see yeah. Valorum charging up San Juan Hill, though. <laughs> he doesn't seem like a rider. I mean... I mean, like, maybe he's a new, he, he likes nature, I don't know, maybe he's a hunter. He's general fucking Zod. That's true, so you got, you got Neil before him, so, um... Yeah, he, he's been there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um... But yeah, like, Honestly, like, so just yesterday I finally finished uh, Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast. Ah, uh, Jedi I love that game. It's so uh, fun. It, I, it genuinely, I never played it just a kid, it genuinely holds up. It's fantastic. I had to uh, cheat codes all the time, though, because I kept dying. I was terrible at it, but it was so, it was so much fun. <laughs> oh, I died. To sh- I had to save, like, every five seconds during some fights. That game is hard. Yeah, and there's no difficulty setting, I don't think. Yeah. Or at least I couldn't find one. Uh, but yeah, like, that reminded me of why I like the Imperial yeah. Remnant so much. Because you could very much have, you know, you have your technology for the threat, you have kind of them established, people are familiar. But then the actual idea of what they're doing uh, and who they're specifically fighting can be, you know, completely modular. It's, it's what we're doing with the Mandalorian. You know, you can have the Empire taking over small areas and claim that it's up to be a you know, peacekeeping force. You can have them, uh, you know, be more cultish-like, like the Empire Reborn. Maybe, you can uh, have, I feel like you got the Herzog remnant. Oh, that's just what I get from the clip. I feel like they're now essentially just mafioso, but with Stormtrooper outfits. Yeah. They're like, there's the like, new Java. The new yeah, Java. and like, that's such a cool idea. I'll be very curious to see, once episode 9 is over, like, what the post-Jedi world is gonna do with the Imperial Remnant. Because, obviously, you can't be, they can't be too massive, because that's the First Order's job. Um, but, you know, it's sort of like, but I feel like we're gonna retcon, maybe, be the word? I'll use that word for now. Kind of, oh, there's more Imperial Remnant than Aftermath kind of led on to. Um, mm-hmm. I think even in the, in fact, um, I think it was in the new Jedi, I, I remember reading a review for the new TIE Fighter, or for that Alphabet Squadron tie-in book, uh, one by mm-hmm. Jody Hauser, and, um, the, 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 the Empire proper had to go up against some stormtroopers, and they're sort of like, you know, they, they, they cut off from the Empire proper, and like, you know, like, no, we're doing our own thing now, like, we're not defecting your balance, we're, we're our own thing, so I feel like they're setting up, like, there will be more Imperial Remnants down the line. Mm-hmm. Um, but I gotta say, one of those small little things that I loved in uh, Jedi Knight is, like, random lines that you hear Stormtroopers and other Imperials say. Uh, I love me is they talk. Ke- well, they, they kept the thing from the Thrawn trilogy that I always loved, yeah. where Stormtroopers will refer to them... Uh, I think it's like Stormtroopers will refer to them as the New Republic... Mm-hmm. And then officers will call them the rebels. Ah, uh, yeah. Like it's that it's that thing where you know you have like the we don't want lower to level. Could, we don't want yeah, like the cadets refer to them as the new republic, and Pelion's just like, what was that? You They're the rebellion. Out. 
you can't really they have to they have to maintain maintain that uh but yeah like other conflicts i, I would like some smaller scale say so, like if we're looking at like real world you know history i don't want another big ideological thing i want some more like just strictly political wars if that makes any sense kind of like well uh, politics like, and ideology like, are intertwined. yes but like what i'm saying is the difference between like world war Two versus my example of like the balkan wars Ooh, that'd be fun yeah where like that was very much a border dispute uh <laughs> and that was so many various groups that it wasn't you know the fascist move, movement rising up, it was just differing governments saying, you know, they, they want this territory, or like the Bosnian crisis. Like, I mean, know, to be fair, there was some racism in those wars. Oh, for sure. I, I'm just saying, like, not in terms of an overall ideology thing. It was uh, kind of the Catholicism stuff, and then it was the, the Slavs versus Austri uh, Austria. Like, obviously, you know, religion and racial politics aren't involved in that, but it wasn't a state ideology. No, because that was cool. the thing about the Balkan Wars. No, the, the Balkan League was in name only. No, I think you're right. I, I think you they imagine. killed each other more than they killed Austrians. No, I think you know. I think you can. I think you know. There's, there's strangely there's, there's we're gonna have like two really interesting time periods to show that stuff. We're gonna have the pre Clone Wars. Post Phantom Menace, even pre Phantom Menace, if you count Master and Apprentice, because that was that was a. I mean, I guess the politics of that book is not like it wasn't about the politics; it was about Qui Gon and Obi Wan doing their thing. Um, you know, there was a, that was a small conflict, and then you're gonna have you know thirty years of the New Republic trying to keep it all together. Um, I, mean, I'm sure I really was, hope we don't go back down that route of treating democracy like it's useless. Well, they had 30 yeah. years of peace and prosperity, according to Bloodline, so... Yeah, but no one acknowledges that. It's like, oh, they should have just listened to the military. I'd be very curious to see, like, what sort of stories will be told. Oh, and, you know, we, we joke about this, but I, it, it would be interesting, although you gotta be careful. I think we should be careful. It's like, I call, it, I call it evil Star Trek, but with Ray Sloan as the captain. <gasps> Seeking out... <laughs> wait, 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 so Voyager. Yes. Um, you know, the First Order seeking out strange new worlds, dark side artifacts, and strange Sith Lords to boldly empire where no empire has gone before. To to destroy new life and new civilizations. <laughs> exactly, and then they meet Snoke, and you know, it's like... And then all that stuff happens. Um, Gentlemen, we have engaged the Snoke. Yes. Uh... But no, no, that, that, that'd be something interesting. Empire Space X, First Order Space Exploration. I actually, Space Exploration in general just it sounds like a cool idea. Um, Resistance might do that if it's if, if they're if they're stuck in the middle of nowhere. I hope we don't do that because I want like New Republic attaches. I think. Well, I don't even know what's gonna happen. So or, or Resistance or whatever. But like, I don't want them to. To, you know, kind of settle back into, like, a sort of civilian life. Like, I want there to kind of be the dynamic, like, what the Enterprise had with the Makos. Where, like, you know, there's there's resistance troops on board now. And even if we focus on our own stuff, you know, this is the only real staple base that the resistance has at the turn of the, you know, film. At the turn of the tide. I'm not excited to say at the turn of the tide. Um, yeah. I'll be, I'm very curious. I can't wait for season two. I, I want a trailer. Where's my trailer? <gasps> Give me my trailer, dang it. I want my resistance trailer. <gasps> um, and you know, you're gonna, you're gonna get the Cassian show, and that's gonna be all about spies, and I hope Jabba's involved, because I want Cassian to touch Jabba. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, Doc. How about, how about you bring up something? You, again, we, um, I was just going to say, we, we talked about Clone Wars a bit in terms of, like, how it handled politics. I think it's only fair to talk about, you know, how we see that stuff being handled in the, you know, the animation and, like, novels and comics of the new era as well. Um, like, when you look at stuff like Rebels and Resistance, I think um, you can see, like, a gradual, uh, maybe Rebels less so, because um, Rebels, uh, a lot of the politics we see in Rebels 
uh, tend to come from uh, the way it connects to other things, like, you know, like its connections with Rogue One and Clone Wars and stuff. I think that's where most of the political stuff from Rebels comes from, for the most part. But with, with uh, Resistance, it's mostly uh, we're just going to explore this era and show you what the First Order is like and what they're willing to do to accomplish their goals and stuff. And I think it's done that pretty well so far. Um, and I think that is hopefully a sign that we're going to see, like, extra material. And ob obviously, I want the movies to do it as well. But uh, seeing, like, you know, shows and uh, comics go into, like, the political state of the galaxy more and more as we go on. I think Resistance does a better job of showing its politics through its characters. Um, <laughs> Rebels is, like you said, Doc, more of a connective tissue. Although there's the theme of the found family, which is sort of always there. Um... Well, I don't know if I'd call that political necessarily, but that's a thing that's more thematic. Um, you know, then I think Resistance is probably because I think because Resistance is such a character-driven show. I think it it does a good job. It's sort of like, okay, this is what the the characters and their beliefs and their views on things and how the world affects them and they're affecting the world and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, like with Tam and with Kaz and his belief system and with Eager. Doza, I think they all kind of have a place in sort of watching them evolve and change <laughs> and, you know, make choices and mistakes over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think they did, did a really good job of handling that. And again, a lot of it kind of just depends on who's writing it. Um, at the end of the day, um, and their strengths and weaknesses as a writer, um... You know, I, I think I think the more interesting uh, conflict plots will come in the time period between the movies. Um, although, you know, I was I was thinking about this the other day too. It's like, you know, if you want some major like big factions like three against three or four against four, I feel like the ancient past is an interesting place because you know it's like when Rome was conquering Europe, there really far became the sole big daddy of the world, of Europe, Western world, you know, you got, you got, um, well, what's that kingdom that used to make up a good chunk of Algeria and Morocco? Carthage. Carthage, Carthage that's right. You got the Carthage, and you know, maybe you can do like a, an old tale like the Carthage War between the Old Republic and whatever the... Uh, First and Second Punic Wars. Yeah, the Punic Wars, like the Star Wars equivalent of the Punic Wars at the time. Um, I mean, like, uh, yeah, and you have stuff like the Etruscan Wars and all of that very gradual Rome conquers all of Italy defensively. Yes. Um, strangely enough, I actually, in Master Apprentice, apparently there was a period now called the High Republic. So now we have the High Republic, the Old Republic, the Galactic Republic, and now the New Republic. I bet there's a lot of republics. Do you think there's, like, the Meh Republic? Like, that much of time with, like, it's okay. It could be better. High Repu so when is the High Republic more or less? Well, I don't know. I don't think they ever said. Um, I don't remember. I just remember that was like a thing. Um, it would be interesting if that's like... Because I was thinking just the other day about uh, the Alsacan Wars. Could you explain? For the people so th that? these were a thing that were like more or less, if not entirely, created by Jason Fry. Where like the Republic... And uh, the Alsacans, uh, well, more like Coruscant and the Alsacans had this whole fight over, like, spheres of influence at the very early days of the Republic being a thing. And these conflicts lasted, I think there were, like, 14 of them, and they lasted for, like, tens of thousands of years, because they would go, like, a few thousand years without fighting. Uh, but it was essentially, like, who would, again, who would have sphere of influence, and then... The Alsacans were very much uh, like an aristocracy, uh, small government, uh, more human focused. Uh, they were the ones who had like the Perlemain trade route, whereas the Republic had the Corellian trade spine. And so it was essentially like, you know, the British and the French or the British and the Spanish uh, fighting over like the new world kind of thing. And then their, their spheres of influence, you know, bringing them to stuff like the Seven Years War. Uh, and it was all these, you know, little, you know, series of conflicts uh, with who would be the seat of power. Because Alsacken is, like, right 
by uh, Coruscant. And so, you know, you don't necessarily have, like, a completely perfect thing. It's not like fascism versus democracy. It's kind of similar forms of government, but one that's, you know, smaller versus more centralized, one that's a little bit more run by humans versus one that's, you know, primarily aliens. It's, just, uh, it's economics, and we want our money. We want the money. We want those credits. Yeah. Essentially, where like they, they, it was it was literally about like big business, where the the Arcani, uh, or the Osakans were uh, very much like not wanting tariffs and stuff, and had uh, problems with the new Repu- with the Republic, which is you know was still early, you know controlling uh, what planets did on the trade routes and you know, regulating shit. Well, like, like the, the nice little added thing is they didn't care about massive industry and industrial power except for when it came to weapons. Nice. Like, weapons. then they then they all of a sudden, you know, give a shit. Like, they'll, they'll buy their weapons, but then they'll be all pissy about Coruscant. Uh existing, you know, and having essentially more of a kind of, maybe not populist, but like, not strictly socialist, but you know, Britain versus France kind of thing. Welfare state, I think maybe is what you're looking for. Or, yeah, like, uh, J. Jason Fry's quote, like, historians now generally agree that the conflicts were an expression of socioeconomic tension dictated by the geography of the growing republic. Two major hyperspace lanes, sorry, hyperlanes, lanes, reached out from Coruscant, uh, the Pearl Main trade routes, routes towards the Galactic East, and the Corellian trade runs south, uh, towards the south. Uh, That's funny, funny you mentioned that about the hyperspace lane, because I don't know where I heard this, and I'm sure it's fake. Um, but I heard a long time ago that, like... <laughs> Again, this is probably fake, but, like, Ryan Johnson wanted to, like, with his pitch for his trilogy or whatever he's doing, or whatever he would do, or is doing, whatever, um, like, was going to, is going to be about, like, the first hyperspace travel, and that'd be kind of an interesting, sort of, like, the galaxy finally connects and the fallout from that. That, that, that's exactly the kind of stuff I want, like, you know, you have maybe, like, slip drive or whatever that, you know, get, get you from one place to another, but once it becomes, you know, only, like, a month travel from, like, half of the galaxy to the other half. Like, well, yeah, what does that do? You know, spheres of influence become completely different. Planets that were super powerful in terms of resources become less so if, you know, there's just new random worlds that have no established businesses on them and stuff that now people could just mine resources from. You know, what, what does that do? Uh... And, um, you know, uh, the Game of Thrones kind of influenced how I would tell, like, an old Republic story of, the, like, you know, it'd be like, the, it's just, it's the, the conflict is, like, you build up the this, but, like, the actual conflict is, like, between the various powers that are, like, they won't get their heck to get their act together, even though they know that something even far worse is coming at their doorstep, but they, because they're greedy and they are a bunch of egotists, they keep stabbing each other in the back, making everybody weaker, and it's just like, oh, it's just gonna make everything horrible. Mm-hmm. And, oh, what you saying? And then Charles Dance would be Chancellor. Um, but um, I wonder what the Sith then could be. Like you could pull like from historically. Like what would the Sith Empire be then? Which one? New, the new one that we're gonna make up for the new. If we ever do a new Sith Empire. Um, I I mean because we we have like the new Sith Wars uh, are canon still, and so that Sith Empire. Uh, and then you have that was seemingly like the one that Bane was a part of. And then you have like the Dark Jedi that became the Sith when they were exiled at the end of the Hundred Year Darkness. Uh, and then you have whatever the fuck Malachor was. Like even within canon, you have quite a few. Uh, I guess like politically, uh, maybe reference to like Crusaders or. I, I don't want to say, like, the German barbarians of Rome, but, no, no, they were the ancient enemy of the Romans for decades. Maybe, though it would be kind of cool if, like, 
maybe having the Sith be Rome, or like the Holy Roman Empire, with like smaller planets in, you know, what is now the Outer Rim, but was then their unknown regions, be what that is. So it's like, you know, smaller planets fighting against the much larger Sith. Really? Um, yeah, be cool. Uh, but what I was saying with the, the next thing was like the Alsakini, uh, they did not regard the Republic as the perfection, uh, as the perfection of civilization. They had sought a limited economic and political union. Alsakin was aristocratic in its values, enthusiastic for open spaces and local independence, and cared little for bureaucracy or mass-produced goods except for warships and blasters. The Osakini called the parliamentary group the Axis, uh, yeah. and their national epic, the Arcadia, ad, described the route as an arrow sent into the possible. If the Axis was the arrow, the Osakin was the archer, uh, thus was the young republic divided between two very different civilizations, each born from a, site, a separate hyperspace lane, and in that uneasy juxtaposition lie the origins of the Alsakian conflicts. Alsakian, the younger son, sought distance from authority and established small colonies in the inner rim, while the Spins, which is the uh, Republic trade groups, uh, great trading conglomerates, the grand companies, pressed rimward into the slice uh, in pursuit of raw materials. The settlement of the outer rim caused uh, or around the Perlemane it uh, was bolstered by refugees displaced uh, by Grand Company's activities. Did you say Parlemagne? Perlemagne. I don't know. I feel like... Or maybe I'm thinking... Because there was a name that sounded very similar to that. It's like... It was in the Aftermath book. And they're like, he was the high regent of the Republic who got bludgeoned by a chair. Um... An Aftermath? Oh, uh, yeah. Like, uh... Ray Sloan was talking about how there were myths surrounding Palpatine, and like, like, like she talked about, oh, there were always myths back in the day, like the high region of the Repu the old Republic, Harlemagne life, something, something, and it's like he apparently said he was said to be immortal, and nothing could touch him until he got bludgeoned by a chair, and that when something touched him, um, I'll send you that link. Um, I don't actually, it's somewhere in the in the in the, in the I like we send it now because I know exactly where where it is. Um, I know somewhere in the video. Um, so, um, how do you guys? Uh, were you gonna say something, Joel? I'm just gonna say, here you go. You can look at it later. That was it. Sorry, Doc. What were you gonna ask? So I was just gonna pose a question. So, overall, on a grand scale, like, how do you feel about the way the expanded? Uh, uh, material like the extra material like the novels and shows and comics and stuff how do you feel about the way we've uh, handled politics in the newer eu as opposed to the older eu like on like a grand scale just in terms of the stuff you've read so far how do you think uh, the, the new eu compares to the old eu in terms of how it handles politics well i can't really get into the old eu because i haven't read a lot um i think a lot of i think both really just kind of depends on the author um I, I think maybe the new EU has a bit more I don't know, constraints, might be one word, or just I feel like because they're trying to be more definitive of what they're trying to come across, that um, I think that I think that's definitely, you know, I, I think there's a little bit more of a cohesion there. Um, I definitely think in some of, some of the better stuff, they, get, they can get into more depth, like Rebel Rising, and, you know, um, that, that's... Well, that's well, yeah, Bloodline Zig Two. You know, it's not it's not perfect. Um I think there I think um I think sort of a baseline maybe for the newer stuff because I feel like the I think they they're attempting to try. While I think the old you I mean I don't think it's bad, but you know, I think I think definitely it depends on the author and also, you know, it's kind of the various directions of the time. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I could I could just be biased. Um, Red, uh, you've, I think you've read uh, more old EU stuff than either of us combined. Uh, what's your take on that whole uh, question? I can... uh, I can... Yeah, it definitely depends because there are points where like I really like the fact that in a lot of Old Republic stuff, they're 
became more of a focus on like the ideals of the republic and how it interacted as like an actual political entity instead of just a generic ass term for the government uh but with the new republic you kind of range between uh, really interesting ideas about you know we're, we're building and protecting this thing uh, to then this sort of military centric kind of authoritarian uncomfortable thing uh that, that fits to one of the other quotes that i had pulled uh this one from uh grand Admiral jello uh jay uh this is why i never liked the late EU's championship or ch championing of the military over elected government. Remember the New Jedi Orders thing about a threatened military coup to fight the Fong? That was presented as a good thing, something that very narrowly happened. Where were the heroes of the rebellion who were like, sorry, no, we fought for a democracy and we're not about to lose another one as a result of another war? There are even hints of this in the current canon with the whole General Organa thing. I love that Leia's a general, too, and I get J.J.'s reasoning for this to combat the whole princess thing, but Leia was never a Disney princess. She was a fighter from the start. Our princess was never... Princess was her title. It was never used, with the possible exception of Han, and as a put-down. Moreover, to Lucas, he always pointed to Leia as a senator. He did it in 77. He did it in the commentaries. He did it after Carrie passed away. It was her role as a political leader that Lucas saw her as a driver of the revolution against the Empire. And now we have The Force Awakens with a useless Senate. We have Rogue One with useless senators. Sure, there's Bale and Mothma, uh, but they only exist as cheerleaders for the military. And Mothma, she's presented as foolish with her military disarmament, or at least interpreted that way by fans. I will never get over the desire you're to always present politicians and democracy is bad, but military and especially heroic warriors doing whatever they want, no matter the rules, as ideals. I mean, the heroes of a current saga are literally a private military, uh, paramilitary group. Hmm. And that's why I stand on that. Like, that's my big fear that when that happened in Legends with red tape being treated as this, you know, awful thing and bureaucracy being treated as the enemy more than even the Empire... And that, that's my biggest worry. They can do so much politically one way or the other that wouldn't necessarily piss me off inherently, but that's the thing that I think will take it too far. Hmm. And um, that's not just a problem with the new EU as well. There's also some uh, military uh, fetishistic uh, stuff in, uh, I don't know if that's a word, fetishist, more like fetishiz fetishization, I guess. Fetishism. Uh, uh, of a uh, military stuff in the old EU, you have like those Mandalorian books by like Karen Travis and stuff that are really, really, uh, you know, fetishistic of like, you know, the military and like the Mandalorians are totally better than the Jedi and all that stuff. And that's, that's what I was just saying with the uh, NJL with, you know, nearly having a coup against the, the elected government. Yeah. And I go fight the Vong. Uh, and that yeah, definitely became a thing once you get to like, uh, Legacy of the Force and Fate of Jedi and all that stuff. Also, Joel, I found the thing. You're talking about a uh, Hyler Main Lightbringer. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, Regent of the Old Republic. Uh, recorded fantastic claims that he was born in the dust of the Typhonic... Oh, man, that's a Typhon reference. Typhonic Nebula. Uh, and that he could not be killed by mortal weapons. The last being proven untrue when he was bludgeoned to death by a chair. Ah, you make big claims, and then you get bludgeoned by a chair. Ate the life. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess I'm assuming that's probably a reference uh, to, uh, I think it was Tiberius Gracchi. Because he was he was beat to death by a chair leg Ouch. in the middle of the Senate. Because they didn't, because Rome actually was didn't allow swords in the city. So people would literally use, like, pens. Yikes. To stab each other as a shift. And I think it was Gaius who carried around a sword with him at a certain point, which is very controversial. But because both Gracchi brothers were were murdered, one ripped apart, and Tiberius was ripped apart and thrown into the Tiberius, into the Tiber. Uh 
and then uh, Gaius, I think, is the one who was, yeah, beaten to death with a chair leg. I love Roman I wish... history. Just Damn Romans oh, yeah. be cray-cray. <laughs> I mean, these are the people, because, oh, what was it they wrote? When the Gracchi brothers died, uh, like, it as, like, a public works thing after the fact, kind of to avoid that whole controversy, the next, like, consuls or whatever built, like, a, a new senate or, like, a new temple or something that people decide is using, you know, funds to praise themselves. And Romans so, knew how to party, man. They had the b b pools, and there was sex all the time. Well, the, the, okay, you say that about the pool. The thing is, the bathhouses weren't used for bathing. I know. They were used for some fun. No, no, that's not what the bathhouses were for. What are they used for? When... They were because you would gorge yourself on so much food, and then you would go to the bathhouses to make yourself vomit. Then you would go out and eat more. See? They know how to party. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not kidding. That is what the best house has existed for. This is a giant drainage system for people to make themselves hurt. Nice. Nah. in the Pax Romana, man. Nice. Uh, but, oh, it's like... Um, that sounds like an ancient Roman thing right there. The Harlemagne light. I got filled. That sounds, that sounds awesome. I, I just want to share, like, that sounds familiar. Why do I feel like I know that? And then... Yeah, Parlemagne, uh, or sorry, Parlemagne trade route is still canon as well. A lot of those major trade routes are. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, and then it... Because who, who doesn't, you know... Who, who's going to come up with new names for all that shit? Man, yeah, what's the point? Um, that's, that, that definitely gets into it. That's a discussion about recanonizing, which I would love to do eventually. Um, I think there's something interesting to talk about there. Um, but yeah, um, again, I think a lot of it kind of just depends. I think at the end of the day, it, it does depend on the writer and sort of what they say. Um, you know, and it's like if they're definitive enough or not. I found it. So, m most outrageous to the people when, uh, Opimius celebrated his victory by building the Temple of Concord in the Forum with the Senate's approval. The people felt felt that victory was brought with a massacre of... Because when Gaius was killed, they butchered and cut to shreds a bunch of civilians and threw them all into the, into, like, the river and shit. Uh, and Romans killing Romans is uncommon. That's, every, that, that's Romans killing Romans... Well, no, that's not a thing that happens commonly. Oh. Like, Rome hadn't had political violence for 400 years up to this point. That's a good uh, that, that was the whole thing that Augustus got in trouble for, was when he not only killed, but sacrificed uh, humans that were you know, fellow Romans, including uh, Mark Antony's ex-wife. Uh, because they had, like, planned a coup. Like, Romans don't murder other Romans unless it's like in a civil war. Killing another Roman citizen uh, or even like Pompey's death was horrifying to Caesar because of that. It's you know, Rome had a code. They would they would do some debaucherous shit elsewhere, but you draw a line when it comes to fellow Romans. But yeah, so the people felt that victory was brought with the massacre of so many citizens was ex uh, was exceptionally distasteful. According to Plutarch, one night an inscription was carved into the Temple of Discord that read, this temple of discord is the work of mad, or sorry, this temple of concord is the work of mad discord. I'm sure, <laughs> I, I, I want to Roman I, thing. I want to see some of that in the Old Republic, man. I want to see this, like, who were some of the crazies, and when was, like, when was, like, that kind of stuff happened? Yeah, uh, and we didn't even talk about, like, Palpatine's rise as, like, a reference to Rome, and the fact that that's kind of like, so is he Caesar? Like the emergency powers, yes, but he's more like the Grat guy. But they were populist with reforms. I like that—that's that, why you keep it vague, right? Uh, is the thing. I mean, obviously, like there's clearly Roman stuff. I mean, it's in the name, Palpatine being a reference. No, to I, mean, I mean, George, George talked about that all the time. You know, he yeah, talked about Napoleon and, and Caesar and Hitler and uh, every dictator ever created ever ever came came to power um yeah I know. isn't palatine it's yeah yeah uh 
so the Palatine was uh, the imperial court of Rome since or of Europe since Roman times. So that that's what, you know, Palpatine's name is a freaking reference to, you know, European politics. No, they're right. That's uh, where Paladin comes from. Huh. So Juring was Paladin as a reference specifically to that. So yeah, Palpatine is very much a reference to that kind of stuff. One thing I, I, I would like to see, and I, I'm probably sure maybe the older you went into this more, um, but why was Palpatine so popular? Um, I remember reading the Revenge of the Sith novelization, which is really good, um, and they talk about how Palpatine is the beloved Chancellor. What is he doing that's so beloved? Easy, you push off all the bad decisions onto other people, so either you win and it's your greatness, or if it's a failure, it's someone else's incompetence. That is true. You get yeah, no, you don't get blamed for, for anything. That's yep. you are you are free. Um, You're bullet Churchill. Exactly. I do I do not have to take responsibility for any of this. I'm good. Honestly, they shouldn't have made Radis based on Churchill. They should have just made Krennic because that would work so well. <laughs> just like incompetent egotist. We shall blow up. <laughs> we shall blow up the Death Star in the field and in the streets, and we shall and on the beaches. We shall destroy. We shall blow up this planet, whatever the yeah, cost may be. Will be like Churchill. They blew up a beach, after all. Uh, honestly, if I was in charge of that, I would have faced Radis on my boy Admiral Cunningham. <laughs> I would love to see. I would love to see more pro good guy stuffy British officers in general. <sighs> yeah, because Cunningham's like actually someone you gotta love. He's the guy who. When uh, when Churchill told them to fucking sink French ships uh, after capitulations and the Vichy government being put in charge, he like went three days over the deadline, and Churchill was like, "Just sink them, just sink them, just sink them." Uh, but because he, you know, had a good relationship with the Fran French, I believe had you know spoke French fluently and had been, you know had lived there for a while, uh, like he just kept the talks going and like had his captains meet. The French counterpart, so, so there was this you know, direct association of these are your brothers in arms, even though France has, you know, been taken over. So then they actually capitulated. So while, you know, uh, Holland was shamefully sinking French ships, which he hated himself for, but you know they still ended up having to do. You yeah, know, you Cunningham was showing his strength of will. So if Krennic is Churchill, did that make Tarkin Anthony Eden? Who was Eden again? Eden was the foreign secretary and kind of Churchill and kind of the second. Um, so so he's he's the guy responsible for the Suez Canal crisis as well. Um, oh nice. That's that's that's, that's something. But um, he, so okay, so he 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 was, he was foreign secretary. That's that's like Secretary of State, foreign minister. Um, he was he's young, dashing. Um, and essentially, when Churchill came back into office in the fifties, you know, he wanted to be prime minister because he was younger more energetic, and, you know, Churchill was like, no way, man, I, I want to be Prime Minister because I'm Churchill, even though I'm old, dying, and, you know, probably have a bunch of diseases, because I'm old. Honestly, if, if it comes to, like, but hook nope. up with the person being young and dashing, I would say he's based on Grey. That's true. Well, the Tarkin, well, honestly, Tarkin Tar might be like, <laughs> Tarkin might be like Bula, Bulo. Who's that? Uh, German, oh, fuck, what was his role? I think it was Chief of Staff? Aren't you thinking of Keitel or Yodel? No, uh, Bernhard von Bülow. He was uh, Secretary of State from 1909 to 1919. Uh, sorry, 1900 to 1909. Ah, so he was of the German Empire. Yeah, he was actually like he he. he quit, like, several times, and kept getting dragged back in uh, um, by Wilhelm, because Wilhelm kept kicking him out and being a dick every time he said something smart. That sounds, yeah, that, that's Willy. That sounds like Willy. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he was, he was really actually quite good, and then you have uh, Bethman, Paul Wegman. Yeah, I need, I, it's so hard to keep so many of these people straight because I can't pronounce their names, so it's harder to recognize. Right. Um, 
That's another thing I feel like we try to do too often. Um, it's just like it's fun. I'm, I'm not saying it's not something we shouldn't do. It's like, well, who is this com leader compared to? Like, who is Tarkin compared to? Who is, you know, it's never a one-on-one -on -one comparison. You know, you compare Tarkin to that guy, and it's like, I, I always say, oh, Tarkin's the Himmler of the, of the Galactic Empire. Um, minus his own organization, I guess. Um, and so would Veers be the Rommel? I guess so. Ground Commander, yeah, works. And then I guess... Uh, Ron uh, Dernitz, then? I don't know. Tag would be uh, Raider. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know who would be Donut Donuts. V P P it? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, well, no, uh, it would be... Uh, Maybe Thrawn, because like special weapons, because because Donitz was the head of the, uh, uh, what was the what was the name of the division for the, uh, I don't uh, remember U boats. I don't remember. I just... Well, funny enough, he no, actually no, it would be Thrawn because Donitz became the head of the Third Reich at the end of the war, and he was a Grand Admiral. <laughs> so it's there. There's your compare. There's the there's the link. I guess after everyone else. No, just that kicks the bucket. Yeah, that's that, that's exactly why Hitler chose him, because Goering had betrayed him, Himmler had betrayed him, Goebbels wasn't leaving that bunker. Um, I think Raider was dead. Him, Hitler hated. Actually, no. I mean, Hitler hated the army in the Luftwaffe, so it's like only the navy was the only thing that he actually like. You didn't disappoint me. So I'm going to reward you for that. Really? Because he, he kind of hated the Navy. He said that it was a whole distraction. Well, end. surface Navy. So you're right. Surface Navy. By, the, like, end. by, the, by the end, he didn't hate the Navy. Because he felt like, well, the Army screwed me over. The Luftwaffe screwed me over. Thanks, Goering. The SS screwed me over because Himmler was trying to save his own skin. You know, um, Goebbels, again, wasn't leaving that bunker because he was crazy. You know, um, who was his chief of? Staff. Oh, I know the chief of staff of Hitler. Um, oh, I thought Borman. Borman wasn't gonna take over. Everyone hated him. So I was like, no, Dernitz is kind of like the only option left. Yeah, and and like so Thrawn, he was the only option left. Because you know, yeah, Vader I, was, I guess so. Vader was dead. Tarkin was dead. The Emperor was in a clone, and he wasn't gonna come back anytime soon. Yeah, um, Raider was just like. Like, oh, now you like the Navy. I ask for damn ships, and you're like, oh, no, that's just useless. But now... Because um, Raider was always so fucking pissed at Hitler. I... Like, those two fought each other constantly. Oof. Uh, Surprised he didn't get... Did he eventually get sent to a camp, or... Uh, let me... No, he was... Uh, at Nuremberg, he was sentenced to life in prison, but released early for failing health. Gotcha. And then he uh, became... And then he, he died became. in Kiel in the, no, uh, 1960. Though secretly he became young using alien technology, and now he serves Hydra. Because that's happened. You need shield. Um, nah, I'm kidding. It's weird that so many of the Creed's Marine lived... I hope you're getting a good education here, Doc. Uh, I am. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, I've been reading World War II stuff and uh, at sea, and Joel has been ju just finished a course. So, like, yeah, we, we have we have absolute Ooh. monsters on the minds. Well, I I watched a documentary called Hitler's Inner Circle on Netflix. It's kind of like all the major power players, like um, you know Hess, Bormann, Himmler, Goering, Speer. You know, all, all those guys. I guess Thrawn's also a bit like Spear, too. Yeah, kind of. Or, no, who would... Uh, honestly, maybe... Uh, what's his face? Uh, I can't remember his name. Masamita might be like Spear. Yeah, that's true. He's kind of the one who handed things over. Uh, yeah, who was... You tissue and then it's Goebbels. Trust me, if you know anything about Goebbels, he loved Hitler. And I mean, he loved Hitler. Like, I'm married to Hitler before I'm married to my wife. Well, that's terrifying. 
Uh, I mean, he killed his kids because he didn't want to live in a world without Nazism. Jeez. Oh, you mean his wife was worse? They they both like, yep, yeah, we're gonna kill our kids, then we're gonna kill ourselves, and they did. Gribbles with a nutter. Uh. Okay, so chief of staff. Uh, of the German army that was back. That was after thirty-eight. Uh. Now I'm interested in, in what the... Who would then Ray Sloan be, then? What's a good comparison for her? Hmm. Um, because there's... Okay, so... Kreb, Hans Krebs was... No, that's General Infantry, Head of Staff. Chief, chief of Staff. Did they, I don't, do they even have one? Oh, Hitler uh, disbanded the general staff and sort of divided into like two groups. Yeah, so you, you were saying, you know, who was chief of staff? I guess he didn't have one. Yeah. It was just whoever was, in, yeah, because the previous one was Beck, who had plotted, uh, assass who was a part of the uh, uh, 20th of, uh, the 20 July plot. He was the guy who was planned to be president. That's right. I'm surprised we don't get more military coups against the emperor. I mean, they're all going to fail, but, you know. Yeah, there, there was, like, one in the Empire I comics. had that comic book, and, like, one of the moths was, like, this weird-looking mechanical dude. Like, this, like, with, like, a Darth Vader-like mask and robot eyes. Um, but, yeah, like, that, I remember that. Um, what was I going to say? But yeah, Hitler, Hitler divided the chief of staff, because, you know... He liked his competition among his officers, because uh, that means they weren't uh, all aiming at him. Yeah, I mean, remember, that's what uh, Tsar Nicholas did. If someone was seen as too competent, or the people liked them, he would immediately fire them. Ah, uh, Tsar Nicholas. Like, uh, Wilhelm is so complicated, because he's such a petty, <laughs> Trumpian little shit. But he's also like a child, whereas Nicholas is just so incompetent and noncommittal that it's like you can almost see Wilhelm as this just like racist, idiotic little kid. Oh, heck whereas yeah. Nicholas just like refuses to do anything. Oh yeah, I so it's like I honestly sympathize almost more with Wilhelm. Oh, I mean, you know, oh, you should, you I mean, you should hear about his childhood upbringing. It's like. Something went wrong, big time. Oh, uh, yeah. Bad, yeah. bad, bad parenting. Um, I know what the sad Both thing of is. Them. I know what's sad, you know, it's like sad, like, because his father died of, like, throat cancer, like, way too young. You know, it's like, that's why the, that's why Wilhelm was so young when he took over. It's like, his father died prematurely. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, he fucking fired uh, Bismarck. You know, Bis yeah, Bismarck. It's like, uh, reading about that, and in fact, I think that's one of the big things where B uh, Bilo had wanted to leave. I think that was, like, the first time he handed in his resignation of the 50 times he fucking did it. <laughs> like, seriously, read. Uh, now that you're, you're, you're done with courses and you're in summer, you gotta read Margaret Macmillan's Road to 1914, The War That Ended Peace. It's, like, 600 pages. I think but I've it's... seen that book in my bookstore, and I think I've looked it up, too. Oh, I should have bought it. I knew I should have bought it. Uh, it's it's the one that I read. I read. It's it's very long and exhaustive, but it's so good, and it incorporates so much in the way of like political cartoons. I love it. Like, I now have a file in my computer because I had to look them up later because they're so good. But yeah, like this is something that I think Star Wars should have. Like instead of the focus on the military. Let's get some, you know, actual faces to the politicians. Yeah, like, again, I'll just keep saying it. Charles Dance as the Chancellor who ruled with an iron <laughs> fist. I need that in my life. Um, uh, I actually, who's, Moth, who's Mothma's chief of staff? I think they actually said once. Oh, yeah, isn't it? Uh, or is that just her advisor? I always forget. No, her, her chief, isn't her chief of staff... Uh, Political uh, or military? I forget. It's gonna have a military one. Uh, I think Akbar would take this job. Um, 
Well, I'm probably tired, right? It was well, what's his face? The the Singer. I thought no, I think I thought that well, I know I, there's Singer and then that other uh, girl that Mothma has with her. Yeah, the uh, cuz she uh, like, like parents. Yeah, she wanted are, like an idealist and then she needed Singer because Singer can get the stuff done. She cuz he's not afraid to like crack some eggs. You know yeah, I'm you, you, you need the cynical a hole. <laughs> yeah, I, I always like that. I always like that. Why he she appointed Singer? Like, look, I need a cynical. You know what? On my team, to just tell me the facts, and not sugarcoat it. Code it. I love how Singer's like, look, I don't believe in your democracy or your system or any of this, but fine, I'll help you out. Um, I like that. You need you need people. <laughs> Like I like that. You need you need sometimes just non ideological just cynics to do help you out sometimes because they get the mm. job done. Um, I so um oh sorry I I just want to say one more thing. I'd be interested in the Star Wars equivalent. I guess World Clone Wars is kind of the Star Wars equivalent of World War One, but I don't know what the tr what a good true equivalent of World War One the Star Wars Galaxy would be like. That's uh, the thing is. I, mean, I, I don't think it. you can ever yeah. create like a fictional, even remotely equivalent thing. That's true. That because you can't have like a a good guy or even a protagonist you follow without it getting ten kinds of uncomfortable because of just how blameless and everyone is to blame and just. That's why World War One movies are hard to make. Yeah, that's, that's right, why don't... I just like Wonder Woman. I'm like, I don't feel like her kicking grenades into trenches is epic. All I can think of is, you know, all quiet on the Western Front and the German men who were dying and the fact that I have no more hatred for them than I do for the British or the French. Yes, that's, that's why That's why there aren't a lot of World War One movies. Huh. Well... I love what Battle uh, Battlefield One did. With I that heard that was a good. I heard that was a good campaign too. I it's apparently very short, but I, I love the idea of what the first battle is, where you like you're just having this massive kind of early days, so like not dug in in trenches, but just kind of running around uh, a small amount of like woods with a few structures around there. And, like, every time you die, you don't reload or respawn. Instead, the, it gives a name for that soldier, a rank, and a birth and death date. Oh, yeah. And then it pulls you over to another soldier on the other side. And then it just keeps going until you, like, die a certain amount of times. So you have the exact same equivalent. And, and like, you see some of these guys are just, like, 18. Barely. And you just keep switching between sides. You are both, and both just is like senseless and putting you in those shoes, and it's just gut wrenching. It's like that is how you do a World War One game. For the you know thousand times we've had a game with you know steaming the you know storming the beaches on D-Day, that is the only acceptable way to do World War One is to just make the player want to cry. Yeah, unless you're me, and you're a soulless, heartless person who doesn't. Oh, we both know that when it comes to World War One, even you would break, looking at that stuff. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Doc, what were you going to say? I interrupted you. Um, what I was going to say was that um, uh, a question I was going to pose is, in terms of like how they handle politics, uh, what are your guys' uh, favorite like uh, Star Wars novels or comics or even like episodes from shows or whatever that have that you think really effectively deal with the political stuff in Star Wars and really do a good job of keeping it consistent and interesting all the way through. Ooh, how about you start? I'll think of something, because you've got like, a bigger pool than me. Um, I can start if you guys want. Uh, sure, go ahead. Um, a couple of, in terms of animation, a couple of examples I would bring up are the Ryloth episodes from uh, Clone Wars as well as the Abar episodes. Um, I would also uh, bring up In the Name of the Rebellion from Star Wars Rebels and uh, pretty much any episode with Hera or Cham in it. I think uh, uh, Rebels handled their relationship really well, and I liked what they did with Cham and the Free Ryloth movement. And uh, speaking of Cham, I also like Lords of the Sith and what they do with him in there, um, as well as a Rebel Rising, obviously, in Bloodline. Uh, and in terms of comics... Um, I haven't read that many current uh, comics, to be honest. There are only, like, two or three runs that I'm following specifically. 
Uh, but I guess to talk in terms of the old EU, um, I really enjoyed the Quinlan Voss comics by John Ostrander. I think he does a good job of exploring, like, uh, with just Ryloth alone and just, like, the system and the hierarchy of that planet and, and like, the prejudices of uh, Twi'lek society. I think uh, those comics deal with that stuff really well. I'm trying uh, to think back in the thing for Twi'lek. You bring them up quite a lot, Doc. What's funny is that 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 stuff is the reason why I don't like the Ryloth arc that much is because of just how compelling Ostrander made the flaws of Twi'lek society. Where instead of being space Afghanistan with the space French, <laughs> it's like which is especially weird when you think about it. Because when I think French and uh, like Africa and the Middle East, I don't think like positive freedom fighters. I think. Algerian wars? Maybe we find out in those 30 years that the Ryloth had their own Algeria incident. They got oh, strong. God. They got strong really quick after the Empire fell. And they got a little cocky. That, and then they do fucking Vietnam. Yes. Um. Yes, I want that now. Um. Sorry, Doc, did you have any more? Uh, those are just ones off the top of my head. Uh, what um, do you guys have? Well, I, I like Plagueis. Plagueis is always fun with the machinations. Um, I've always enjoyed Bloodline. I always thought that was just cool. Sorry, burping. Um, the era. Resistance, obviously, I think, handles their politics quite well with just the characters and stuff, like with Tam and her decisions. Um, I've always liked Aftermath Empire's End, but I don't know if it's for the politics or just for some of the character stuff. Um, uh, that's always, but that's always been fun for me. Um... Although I think I'm just listing my favorite EU books at the time. Um, let's see, let's see, anything from Legends I can think of. I guess the Revenge of the Sith novelization, that, that's, there's some interesting stuff there. Um, let's think here. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Prime Trilogy got some interesting stuff in there too, of the original. So, um, yeah, those, those would be my choices. Okay, Red. Yeah, I think Heir to the Empire, like, the rest of the Tron trilogy kind of goes off with Force Crayola, but, like, the stuff just in Heir to the Empire is really good with how that, you know, actually functions, how tough it is to actually create a democratic government. <laughs> uh, Bloodline is obviously amazing. Rebel Rising, I think, has the best take on oh, overall geopolitics. I forgot about Rebel Rising, I think. I'm adding that to mine, too. Uh, I think, like, in terms of Legends, uh, Ascension of Warfare, which is where that El Sack and stuff comes from, uh, Jason Fry is fantastic oh, I when it comes to politics. I didn't know we were going to add the uh, um, visual addiction guides, too. <laughs> I would have chosen that. Um, it's so good. It is weird. It is good. I like, I like Essential Guide to Warfare. It's a good one. Um, you find such a good way of making it not just like a source book, but genuinely good storytelling. Yeah, I'm glad Jason Fry still. I'm still glad still Jason Fry still doing stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, I think. Oh, so. I'm sorry, I almost forgot about one more that I want to mention. Uh, Inferno Squad. Oh yeah, oh. we we did. Inf I forgot you and I did Inferno Squad together. That yeah. I thought that handled it. Pre I thought it handled uh, that story pretty well. Um, yeah. That was one of the things I got a little weird, worried about reading it. I, I thought I handled its politics more or less pretty well. Um, yeah, I, I think, and it made me really excited to see if they would expand on that stuff in the Battlefront 2 uh, story mode for the game, and they don't really. Uh, I think Empire's End does do a really good job uh, with that stuff, like the selection of, a, of you know the next planet and the fallout of the, the terrorist attack and all that stuff. Uh trying to think like the empire comics overall do a really good job uh there's oh, what's what's the art the one with the uh amount of men uh, it's like I, I think it's like to the last man uh and it's fantastic it's essentially zulu but in star wars yeah. what? Okay, have, you, have you watched the film zulu no, nah, I've never seen Zulu. I've heard uh, about I it. I haven't I, either, but I've heard, I heard so many great things from history buffs. And, like, yeah, essentially, it's it's Zulu, but in space. Uh, and it's just fantastic with how it handles that. Uh, and 
Uh, In the Queen's Shadow is good at some points, other points a bit too vague, but I think the effort is really nice. Uh, but what else is really uh, effective politically? I mean, like, yeah, Revenge of the Sith novelization. Uh, Truzik Bakura does a good job of talking about, you know, treaties and the like. Uh, actually giving, you know, some, some weight to that and showing that as the focus instead of just war. Uh, but yeah, honestly, Empire's End might be the best other than Bloodlines for canon. I was just thinking about this. Um, I remember somebody brought this up. It's like the negative impacts of the of, of changing the capital. It didn't, it wouldn't it be like the, the Olympics coming to a poor country? Like, what happens when a, a backwater world gets chosen as the capital? Like, what happens then? You gotta build the... the infrastructure and it's probably chaos it's like what happens when something like that happens yeah Tatooine gets, Tatooine gets chosen as the capital of the new republic I didn't even know Tatooine was a member I don't think it is I'm just I'm just I'm just making that up um yeah it, I mean it's a heavy agricultural world that apparently bombarded itself in its attempts to stop the empire like they really do not need major industry being moved there yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe there's regulations we don't know about, I don't know, maybe it's like you have to meet some sort of standards, or maybe you can opt out, I don't know. Oh, probably, oh, I mean, almost certainly, I don't I, think they're gonna put a plug the government capital in a, in a planet that doesn't want to. I would hope so. <laughs> they just start moving shit down. And like they like the people in Nepal, which like, wait, wait, what are you doing? And they're like, oh yeah, we're, this is the capital now. And you have these like workers with like heavy New York accents, and they're like, well, you go talk to your senator. We're gonna continue doing this job. This is not a New York accent. I don't even know what I'm doing. But it's like it's like the scene in the it's like the scene in Robot Chicken when the emperor has to talk to the construction worker. Exactly. <laughs> uh, like, I don't tell you how to, to, to you know, intimidate your blonde kids, so let us get back to work. Uh, I, I, okay, I, good talk. Good talk, team. <laughs> oh, I love that moment. Um, actually, it's funny in Air of the Empire, you brought that up. Um, I love how Luke is, like, moving the capital to Coruscant. It's like, I don't think this is a good idea. It doesn't seem to send the right message. I like, I, I, that's like one of the first things he actually says in the book, like, well, not says, but thinks, it's like, this kind of feels wrong, being in the Imperial Palace. Yeah, and Leia's like, well, it's a, you're already here, and we're not, and you're, you're not just gonna say no to a palace. I mean, I wouldn't, like, give me that. Like, but I do, I do like the fact that it's like, well, it is built on the former Republic, but right? Well, I mean, I think back in the day, yeah. When they were making it back in the 90s, um, yeah. Well, no, I, th I think it still was into, like, the rest of Legends. Uh, uh, there's, uh, what, the Emperor's Palace uh, <coughs> and the Jedi Temple was just kind of left abandoned. Which, yeah, have we even done anything about what the heck is happening to built out of the Jedi Temple? I'm sorry, what? Oh, you kind of cut off. Uh, have, have we ever done anything with the new palace being built out of the Jedi Temple? Like, I mean, post-Empire taking over? Or, sorry, post-Empire being defeated? Uh, no, we haven't seen the Jedi Temple at all. We haven't seen Coruscant at all. So, uh, that's still open for lots of things to be told. I'm sure Luke's probably, was like, first the thing that he did when he got the Coruscant was like, I'm going in. I'm gonna see what's in there. Help build my new Jedi school for the gifted. Uh, Professor Skywalker's school for the gifted. Uh, sorry, I just got an X-Men reference there. Um, no, we haven't heard much about the Imperial Palace post-Jedi. Um, clearly, I'd, um, I know Luke was very... I, the only thing I know is from the last Jedi novelization that Luke... Luke wanted to make sure that he knew all his stuff before he started a Jedi Order. That's for sure. Like, he wasn't, like, gonna be like, Oh, Empire defeated, let's start the Jedi Order. Like, he, he wanted to make get it all his ducks in a row. Like, okay, I'm gonna make sure I don't screw this up. 
You know, I want to make we want to make sure I, I don't screw myself over. I don't screw them over. I want to make sure I'm ready. I know my I have my lesson plan. I have the lesson plan. Um, I have all the information. That's actually is something in the Battlefront um, game. They actually do talk a little about, like, you know, Luke trying to find all this old Jedi stuff. So he can get ready for Jedi Order 2.0. The Luke version. I, I'm just kidding, of course. Um, but no, he, he did want to... He wanted to make sure he was ready to go before he started anything. Yeah, and I like how Ben kind of has to, you know... Like, opens Heir to the uh, Empire by essentially just being like, Oh my god, get your shit going, Luke. Yes. Because he literally opens with Luke drinking hot chocolate that Lando gave him. And then Obi-Wan showing up and being like, Yeah, so my force is going to disappear, but get your damn shit together. <laughs> exactly. Come on, Luke. He just disappears for the last time while giving him the finger. I have to go because the Force Ghost says I can't stay anymore. But we're all gonna have a party. Force Ghost party. What he really, yeah. What he really means by that is I can't deal with your shit. <laughs> um, but no, I, I'd be interested to see uh, the Je Jedi Temple. It's like that got desecrated. Um, you know, it'd be like I'm sure this has happened in real life. I can't think of a historical. Parallel. The cult of reason through a. As Lindsay Ellis called it, inside of your mom. That's true. Huh. Uh, the cult of the, the Supreme Being, Being did a lot of that, actually. Yep. Uh, the the, the cult of the Supreme Being is different than uh, the cult of reason, though, of course. One being atheist, one being whatever the fuck you want to call the cult of the Supreme Being. Ah, we're little cults. Actually, that is something I feel. I'm sure Old Cannon did that too. Um, and maybe this is the last thing we can touch upon, because we're going on two hours. But this is fun, but this has been fun. Um, I feel like the... Oh, like, I, I think Old Cannon probably does this, too. I just probably haven't had any good examples of, like, showing us now, like, little cults and religious factors. Like, we got the Afra thing with the cult of the Order of Respect to... That's what they're called, right? Yeah. Okay, I thought I was make. I thought I was thinking of something else. You know, you got all the little... We got little hints of it, and, like, on Jetta, and what's, you know, like, you got the Guardians of the Wills. Um, oh, let's see. What What else? There's been a few others. I, uh, I mean, in Legends, that's what the uh, Death of Mary Night Sisters are. Yeah, you got the Night Sisters. You got the Night Sisters for the dark side. Uh, there's small re religions that aren't Force-based. Like, there's that one from Truce of Bakura that actually just likes the Force, or just likes using it. Isn't that the one that became Luke's girlfriend? Or it's very funny, yeah. His many love interests. Um, She's one of the few that didn't die. Though no. I do think she came back later and got possessed and then killed, because that's like the first thing that Abeloth did, was possess all his girlfriends and then kill them. Luke's like, oh no, my worst fear come true. All of my exes together. Um, You know, you got the Acolytes of the Beyond, that, that was cool. Um, so, you know, I think it's just cool seeing the little, the little cults, um... Yeah, I mean, the Empire Reborn was kind of like that. Yeah, that's true. They could disarm it, that's uh, true. Um, disarm his gang. Um, that'd be cool. Uh, disarm it, the boys. Disarm the boys, man. <laughs> Him and Fyar. Who was voiced by Steve Bloom. Steve Bloom <laughs> does, like, a vet Star Force actor. Like, heck, you know, um... Kyle Katarn's girlfriend partner is voiced by the voice of Hera, so... Yeah, when they... Well, yeah, Vanessa Marshall voicing Jan when they decided to whitewash the character. Ooh. Because remember, she's, uh... She's Asian. Oh. I see uh, and, and played in live action. In fact, like, the first... If, if I remember correctly, like, first named Asian character in a Star Wars production... Uh, let alone live action, you know, lead in a Star Wars anything until The Last Jedi oh, was yeah. the actress who portrayed her in the uh, uh, full motion video for Dark Forces 2. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot Dark Forces 2 was live action. It took all the way from that to Rose before we have another one. Well. What about Donnie Yen? He's the death. Oh, wait, Asian woman. Yeah, woman. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like, uh, don't say Legends never did anything for you, because at least there were some, you know, good steps that then immediately got erased. Oh, yeah. 
I actually forgot. I, I don't even think they kept the same voice actor voice actor for Kyle Katarn either. Yeah, I don't remember exactly. But yeah, that that was unfortunate. Yeah, I actually kind of forgot. That. And then there was that whole thing in Legends early on where uh, Asians were an alien species. They were called. Were they called? Did, wait, were the alien species called Asians? No, but they no, but Asians in universe were aliens, and their species was literally named after like the part of the eye that is different. Oh wow! Uh, I'm not kidding. That's actually a thing that they did. Was that Lucas like, himself who did that? Or? No, it was the guy in charge of uh, freaking uh, Shadows of the Empire, like describing them as exotic. And like the, the you know one of the well she's sort of got that that kind of Fu Manchu look you know, you know that Inquisitor uh, who's played by an Asian actor in Dark Forces Two uh, Asian American oof. I don't I haven't watched Dark Forces Two in a while I only remember Jarek and his female companion and then the guy who's just a floating torso yeah uh, but one of them is played by an Asian American and like he's not Asian in universe he's not human. He's a such and such, and it's just like, oh my god, who's that? I when I first heard that, I thought people were joking. It came up several times. I thought it was a joke, and then I like actually looked it up. I'm like, oh my god, this is a thing. And people are like, yep, this was an actual thing. The nice. and, and later writers immediately afterwards, which is like, what the fuck? <laughs> Whose idea was it? So like, that's why. You know, they, they moved past it. And, like, there was... There's been pushback in the past when it came to, like, stuff like, I think, what are they... Not Tholians, that's Star Trek. Like, Adigalia species and stuff. Mm. Where, like, why aren't they just humans? Which then creates the whole discussion of whether or not she has tentacles or that is a hat. I don't <laughs> think I want to know. <laughs> that's, that's an ongoing debate among I'm fans. I'm scared to know. That's been happening since literally Revenge of the Sith. Or, sorry, not Revenge of the Sith. Since Phantom Menace hit theaters. I like Addy Gallia because of the Jedi Starfighter. That's a good game, by the way. That, I mean, I, I always assumed that was a part of her head because one of the younglings in the younglings episodes has that same thing she has. So, I mean... Well, or it's just a... Hat, it's a, a, it's a, a cultural yeah, it be a hat. cultural thing. That's, I, the, that's the debate. It's, it's yeah. cultural. I'm, I'm afraid to know now. I don't yeah, know. It, it, they've been very iffy on that. And then, like, there's a point where... Oh, what are the, what's the species... Oh, well, what's the uh, planet? Harunkal. The people from Harunkal, like, <sighs> at one point in one of the atlases, were referred to as near-humans, which was incredibly fucked up, and very much not the case in Shatterpoint. So it's, like, literally going around and being like, oh, these humans in Star Wars look like real-world Asians. Near-human. Oh, these people who are very clearly based on Africans. Near humans, it's like, oh, God. Yeah, and I'm on Wikipedia now, and it says that uh, people from Harun Kal are humans, so it's a good Yeah, thing. I know, what I, what I, that, that's what I was saying. It's just one atlas that randomly changed that. Which, no it's, it's absolutely a human in the book, which means that someone must have looked at them and been, oh, they must be, you know, not human. Who wrote that atlas, I must have won. I, I don't know, it might have been, I mean... There's so many people who work on those things that you, you never Lucas. know who to blame. Nah. <laughs> it was the Lucas person who wrote it. Uh, 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 well, 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 like, they kind of look fun, fancy. Yeah. I can just imagine, like, uh, uh, they kind of look fancy. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're near human species. Yes, I'm torn. I mean, look at just how, like, how much cultural appropriation is in the sequel, or is in the prequel trilogy. Mm. What are you gonna There's, like, two species that are the Jews. <laughs> And there's two species that are freaking Asians. But hey. Well, like, what the hell? But still. I still was happy when we got to see Waddle's Bar Mitzvah ceremony. It was fun. <laughs> well, whose idea was it that after all of the uncomfortable Jewish stereotyping from Phantom Menace went into episode two and said, let's give him a yarmulke. <laughs> like, who the fuck? Was is that okay? actually what that is? I mean, I don't care what it actually is. That's a yarmulke, dude. But, no, no, because they were going to do the Star Wars version of Fiddler on the Roof starring Wild. 
And I mean, okay, H-Y. that would be worth it and amazing. If I were a Victorian, yippee I would have loved a Star Wars musical sung like 50% in Yiddish. <laughs> uh, was Watto actually voiced by an Italian actor, or was it a white or dude G- doing an accent? Or Jewish uh, Italian actor. Yeah, he, well, yeah, that's the that's the tricky thing because he said like they say, oh, it was it's it's very much an Italian accent, which like, okay, fine, but like he is so. Either he's a very poorly done Italian mafioso accent, or he's a Jew, or even more so, best of bo- worst of both worlds, they decided to make him a Romani stereotype. Just to make things even worse. I don't know which. Uh, I mean, I think the worst thing is definitely Newt Gunray. Mm. With the fact that they literally had uh, uh, Taiwanese people to, like, read the lines. And then... Oh, sorry, not Taiwanese. Uh, Thai. They had... Because I was thinking there's different elements that the Nemordians are stolen from. So, like, bits of Thai, bits of Japanese, bits of China, bits of Indonesia, they're just a cavalcade of cultural appropriation, mm. but like literally, they Lucas had the lines read by people from Thailand, and then had a you know Brian, well, not Brian Blessed, to had the guy who played Gunray read them, mm. and the defense is essentially, oh, but he has a really unique racial background. It's like yeah, none of which is Thai. <laughs> I don't uh, care. Uh, 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 another idea really at the time. Cool, like, yeah, he has a really cool racial background. You should look him up. He's he's really neat. I don't care. But it's fact, not he, me. He gets to appropriate tie. But in fact, he's also the guy who does Keanu Mooney, too. Yeah, he's, he's done a lot of stunt stuff. But, like, every, like, all of yeah, Padme's did outfits, not, sorry. all of Padme's outfits are just straight up stolen. Uh... Mm. And then they're like, oh, let's also take some Native American hairstyles and stuff. And it's like, what? No. What the fuck? Make it weird, but don't make it actually culturally appropriate. <sighs> I mean, it essentially raises the, the, the point of, oh, but we were trying to make it exotic. And it's like, what does that say about you? I don't know. I would just make it up. Like, I wouldn't even look for, for these cultures. Like... Just get on a scribble line, just make something just weird. Although they'd probably be impractical. Uh um, Yeah, I mean, I, her hair is usually impractical. It's just different tied up to a lot of them. Have you seen her headdresses? They're creepy. Um, <laughs> and then, like, Dunray is wearing, like, royal uh, Chinese court headgear. And his hat. That, that's what I'm talking about. Which I love. I as much as I love the hats, I know they're racist. Still. I mean, at l- I guess the alternative is just make up shit like Kai Wen and her stupid hats. She worked for Kai Wen. She, she owned it. She her owned. Vedic hat is just the stupidest thing ever. It's like the Pope. At least the Pope's hat doesn't have, like, bulls in it. Okay, I gotta do this tangent because it, it's funny but relate to what we talked about. So I'm, e- so I'm eating fries at a restaurant once. And I noticed the fry container that I have. Because sometimes you need to like, put fries in like, a little container. And sometimes they just give you on a plate. Anywho. I was looking at the fry container. And for some reason, I just looked at it. And I told my mom. Which my mom is like, this looks like the Pope's hat. <laughs> I think upside down Pope hat. So I'm like, I'm eating off the, in the Pope's hat. Off the Pope's hat. <laughs> El Papa's I mean, hat. totally has food up there, right? Oh yeah, you can, I'm eating off El Papa's hat. I'm talking about the big hat, not the little, but the little white one he always wears. I'm talking about the big one he wears, like for the special ceremonies when he's all robed up. Yeah, El Papa's yeah. hat. Um, okay, uh, this is random, but I just looked up uh, Adigalia species, and for their physical description, it says they are distinguished by their bluish skin pigmentation, scaled craniums, and fleshy white or red tendrils that sprout from their skull caps. So, also the same. So I'm guessing that is it is a part of her body. Neat. Tentacles. Well, you know, it's a Star Wars loves tentacles these days. Yeah. I gotta love the tentacles. Yeah, uh, gotta put them resistance. 
Yes, we need we need raptors and Borgullet in 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 resistance, and we need like yeah, a. Whole... End of the season, there is a distinct lack of tentacles, and that is not going to fly in Kaz's harem. Oh, you know. This is getting resistance, but I'll make this one more point and then we'll probably wrap up. Um, I would love, like, a horror episode on the Colossus with, like, a tentacle monster. Just go full-on cliche horror. They're the monster and it's eating everyone. Do, do, do aliens with Star Wars? I yes. mean, they did that, but make it even more violent. Yes. Like, we had people getting stabbed and, like, the worms and shit with the Geonosian uh, aliens rip off or face this episode. But no, just go full blown with the fucking like John Hurt getting an a you know, giving birth from the out inside. And then it starts to dance. Hello my baby, hello my honey, hello my ragtime gal. That happened in Space Pulse. And it was John Hurt again. Funny enough. <laughs> yeah, John Hurt. I love that that's the role that he will always re- you know, be remembered as. Yeah. Like that that guy who had a worm cro- you know give birth to itself out of him. Yes, the great John Hurt. Uh, I miss him. I can't believe he's gone. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, I guess for final thoughts, you know, Star Wars is always about politics, and we, you know, it's important that we, we challenge it, we call it out when it does some BS, we praise when there's praise to be had, and, you know, we just, we hope for the best. Expect the worst, hope for the best, as I always say. Um, and you know, the the future not set in stone, who knows where things will go with things like Cassian and the Mandalorian, even Ryan and, and even the GOT dudes, you don't know, I don't know, there's so much to, like, there's so much to explore, and, you know, it's the Star Wars galaxy, it's a big world, and I honestly think maybe any story can, any story can really be told, um, really, you just have to maybe find, the, find the Maybe right the book. next one will be about, like, labor rights. And, like, corporations gaining too much power. That'd be fun. And then have them, like, have open, like, uh, you know, like, Republic's Edge or something. That'd be cool. No, no, we what need I'm to... saying is I want a Star Wars thing that is essentially just dunking on Disney. Yeah. Well, Disney, strangely, has been very meta with itself in the last few years. That could happen. Um... Well, they've been better with the... Like, let's address all the, the bad faith criticisms of Beauty and the Beast, but not with the, uh, let's address our horrible union laws. Star Wars needs a union. Star Wars needs to bring back the techno union, but this time they're a union of, of what Tombor workers species. They're on strike, the dang it. What? The Coens. The Coens are on strike, dang it. They're on strike. I mean, that would be pretty cool. Honestly, yeah, when it comes to politics, you know, the internal politics, not making a species just based on, you know, their, their singular planet, but actually showing conflicts within and, you know, labor stuff. That'd be cool. That'd be an interesting way to go. I'm just what Resistance was building towards. Yeah, exactly, and then, you know... We all think it's building to a droid revolution. No, 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 it's building to the revolution of the proletariat. Yeah, then, uh, who, who, who's, who's Trotsky and who's Stalin in this situation? Well, Niku Stalin, obviously. Yes, Niku Stalin and, uh, Buggles is Trotsky. Who's Lenin? I'm just gonna say, you do not want to see what happens to Buggles at the end of season two. I'm scared. I don't... <laughs> just Niku kills him with the fucking ice axe. Yep. And so we'll end you on that note. Yes. And Cass is Lennon. What? Cass is Lennon. Of course. And he will die. And then season, by the end of season two, Cass will have a stroke. And he'll try just to put in his... He'll try to get the transition going, but it's too late. He dies. Yes. So, yeah. On that note, folks. Bye-bye. And enjoy this two-hour-long discussion. See ya. Mm-hmm. Uh, and...